Hey guys, Ben Sleeva here for another good old-fashioned Earthbound video. A lot of you have come to my channel for my Earthbound videos I've created, and stayed for future videos that I will create soon. In fact, that's literally how social platforms work. But over the past few months, I've been struggling to figure out just what I wanted to do for my next video. I thought long and hard about all things Earthbound. Theories, breakdowns, playthroughs, but nothing seemed to tickle my fancy. That was until I thought one of the biggest parts of the game. A part that's even become a meme over the years. You know what it is, and it makes it stand out above all the other games. The enemies. And for this first series, more specifically, I'm talking about the bosses. Now, believe it or not, there are 29 bosses in the game, both sanctuary-based as well as plot-pushing bosses, and this series will cover all of them. So sit back and get ready for this detailed breakdown of each unavoidable. After asking myself what the best order to do them, I've concluded that the smartest way is to start at the beginning and go straight through to the end, not only to help myself stay on track, but also, if you're following along as you play, I don't want to spoil anything. So, without further ado, let's start our list with, believe it or not, one of the best warriors in the franchise, Starman Jr. Starman Jr. appears as the first boss in the game and is revealed to have followed Buzz Buzz, a mysterious survivor of an enslaved Earth ten years in the future, back to Ness's time. It's during that fateful night where Buzz Buzz Meteor lands, and Ness is forced to team up with Porky and Pokey, that we are thrown straight into a battle with Starman Jr. I should say as a footnote that I'll try to keep my speculations and theory out of these breakdowns, but I think it's fair to say that either Starman Jr. was sent or happened to see Buzz Buzz escape and blindly followed him back in time. The Starmen are a race of beings in Earthbound Beginnings and Earthbound. They are extraterrestrial beings and are among original users of PSI. Starmen are common among the higher ranks of Gygus' army. It is unknown if Starmen are organic or synthetic, or if their outward appearance is just a suit. The American Earthbound Player's Guide implies in their enemy description that Starmen are robots. Their speech in Earthbound also reflects this. In Mother 2, Starmen use the Katakana script, which is a common way to denote robotic-sounding speech. The English version, lacking this, gives it whirls, beeps, and clicks to indicate they are robotic beings. However, they may be organic, as the Rust Promoter, which is supposed to damage mechanical enemies, is useless against Starmen of any kind. Also, an enemy called Ghost of Starman is encountered towards the end of Earthbound, but if Starmen are robots, they won't be able to become a ghost. The description of Ghost of Starman in Earthbound Player's Guide refers to it as an alien. They may also be connected via some sort of hive mind. When the Starman Deluxe is defeated, any Starmen summoned during the battle are defeated as well. And the Stonehenge base becomes devoid of enemies, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The members of the Starman species are listed as followed. Starman Jr., Starman, Blue Starman, Last Starman, Starman Super, Starman Deluxe, Ghost of Starman, Final Starman. According to the official Earthbound Player's Guide, Atomic Power Robots are early prototypes to the Starman series. That's kind of cool. So, Starman Jr. shows up smack dab in the middle of our hero's path, and the battle begins. Once locked in battle, you see right away that Starman Jr. is not playing games. Looking at his stats, we see that he has a whopping 999 psychic points. This is what I meant when I referenced him as a great warrior earlier. There is only one other boss that has that high of psychic points, but I'm going to keep his identity secret in case you don't want any spoilers. With all that psychic power comes some heavy-duty firepower. Starman Jr. can use PSI Freeze Alpha, as well as PSI Fire Alpha and Bravo. It's undisputed that Ness, Pokey, and Picky would have no chance against Starman Jr. if it wasn't for Buzz Buzz Power Shield that he sets up early in the battle. Once Buzz Buzz has done his thing, the battle is more or less an auto fighter that takes very little effort on you as a new run player. But there is a way to lose the battle, and it's a bit backwards how it's possible. If you have the patience to fight dogs, birds, and snakes, and level up to level 12 where you learn shield, then you can apply that shield during the battle and, in turn, cancels out Buzz Buzz's shield leading to an almost certain one-hit death from good old Starman Jr. Incidentally, if you would like to skip the fight entirely, that's fairly easy too. Once you rescue Picky and Buzz Buzz joins your team, simply start a fight with any enemy on your way back home. If the enemy wins and you lose the battle, you are transported back to your house with your party the same size as it was before you defeated with Picky and Pokey and Buzz Buzz. Simply walk over to the Minch's house and return the missing boys. People use this approach for low-level runs in which you want to end the game with the lowest possible level. So, there you go. That's all you should need to know about Starman Jr. Are you a fan of his? Do you like Starman Jr.? What's your opinion? Do you hate his interaction? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And the best comment I see before the next video is posted will be pinned to the top of this list. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time when we discuss Frank, a misunderstood leader and a good friend.
When it comes to bosses in video games, there are many tropes they fall into. You have the bosses that have many forms that change as you fight them. You have the bosses that show their vulnerabilities. And then there are bosses that, once defeated, become friends that help you on your journey. John Jones from Super Mario RPG comes to mind, because that's the second best SNES game. But the king of all help is a character from Earthbound that not only has an immediate change of heart, but also is quite pivotal in defeating the big bad. I'm of course talking about robot creating, knife expert, and fail-proof gang leader, Frank Fly. Frank is a young man, said to be under the age of 20, with light blonde hair, square jaw, a straight nose, pearly white teeth, high cheekbones with hollow cheeks. Both his clay model and battle sprite sport a wide, toothy grin. His hair seems to be a mix between a shark fin shaped mohawk and a mullet. Frank wears a dark red double-breasted pinstripe suit, a dress shirt with cuff sleeves, black dress shoes, a pair of black sunglasses, and a shark tooth necklace. One cool cat. Both his clay model and battle sprites depict him wielding a pair of daggers. Frank is a ruthless, yet misguided youth. Prior to the events of Earthbound, he founded the Sharks and took over Ornette, terrorizing the small town and causing many of its residents to move to Tucson. He then established his gang's headquarters at the local arcade. His influence was so great that the Onet police force did not even try to arrest him or his gang, hinting at the police force ineffectiveness. Because no one prior to Ness thought to challenge him to a fight, Frank saw himself as foolproof. If you're ready to fight Frank and Frankenstein Mark II, you need to be at least level 7. I personally would suggest grinding dogs, crows, and snakes until you can fight at least two sharks at a time, and then fight those sharks until you get to level 7. Feel free to level up more, I'm just basing my suggestions off the bare minimum. Also, before the battle, you're going to want to buy the T-Ball Bat, 48 bucks, and I would avoid using the yo-yo because it misses a lot, and the cheap bracelet for 98 bucks. Once you've reached level 7 or higher, you'll have plenty of money to spend on these. Pick up the Mr. Baseball hat from the guy in the treehouse if you haven't already. Once you have the proper gear and level to fight, you're ready to bring Frank down. During the battle, his attacks are primarily physical and deal crude damage. He can brandish his knife, dealing high damage, or come out swinging, dealing less damage. His other attack is that he can say something nasty, lowering Ness's guts during the fight. Despite his strong offense, he has relatively low HP, and can usually be felled in 2-3 turns. Keep your HP above 30 to help you survive his knife attack. Bash him. And if you have reached level 8, I would avoid using Rock and Alpha because you might want to conserve your PP for healing, especially when you're fighting Frankenstein Mark II. Immediately after Frank is killed, and before you're able to do any sort of recovering, he employs Frankenstein Mark II to aid him. Frankenstein Mark II is a robot invented by Frank that resembles a tank with a robotic looking torso, arms, and a head. The Frankenstein Mark II will attack roughly every other turn, and it relies on punches that deal low damage, and will occasionally tear into Ness for significant damage. Its purpose is to teach the player about the defend command. So if you found yourself losing over and over again, take your time during the battle and defend once your HP is high. Since Frankenstein Mark II will only attack every other turn, you should follow an attack and heal pattern. Attack it right after he attacks, and if he's done enough damage to you, heal the next turn. If you're able to keep your health above 35 consistently, then the fight shouldn't be a problem. You'll be through it in no time. Once defeated by Ness, Frank stops calling himself Failproof Frank and begins to call himself Failure Frank. More like Melodramatic Frank, am I right? It? Yep. Now honestly, he's definitely more intimidating leading up to the fight than actually fighting him, trust me. It's when you get caught in a swarm of sharks leading into the battle. That's the real challenge. Now here's a little post-Frank fight tip for you people to know. Once you beat Frank, go back in the arcade, exit again, and re-talk to him. He'll heal you. It's like a free hotel stay, and it saves you the walk up the hill to your mom's house. After Frank is defeated by Ness, he has a positive change of heart and disbands the sharks. In an attempt to shape himself up, he takes a job at the burger shop, where Ness can talk to him afterwards to recover HP and PP also. Frank ends up coming back to assist at the end of the game. I won't spoil that part yet but his friendship goes further than just an old sparring partner turned friend. As for some Frank Fly trivia, in case you hadn't picked up on it before, Frank's theme song, when you fight him, is strikingly similar to Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good theme, which has led to some copyright issues and localizations. And also, if Ness is dead any time during the game, Frank will question Ness's friends, explaining that he doesn't remember being a friend of a friend of Ness's, and he tells them to quit joking around about a circle of friends and to go home. Personally, Frank has been on my top list. The entire city of Onet has been a huge place in my nostalgic mind. When I hear the city theme at the beginning of a run, I feel like a child all over again. Earthbound was one of my first RPGs, and when I first fought Frank, I died time after time, and I'm pretty sure I spent like three hours in Onet. Ah, to experience the whole thing for the first time again. I'd love that. So what are your thoughts of Frank? Are you a fan? Is he too easy of a boss? Do you remember having trouble beating him on your first run? Let me know in the comments, and the best comment by the time the next video comes out will get pinned to the top of this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time for the Titanic Ant.
There's a segment in every video game where things suddenly are different and will be different for the rest of the game. Could be as simple as, now I have a hook shot and I can get over there, or finally I can double jump. Some more subtle than others, some are game mechanics. But in Earthbound, the first glimpse of just how obscure its world is comes from the third boss fight. Before this moment, you had to fight neighborhood animals and people. Normal things that you would expect to find in a neighborhood, you know. But then, almost just like from around a familiar corner, there's an eight foot tall, psychic wielding powerhouse ready to kill you with little effort. We all know who I'm talking about. Titanic Ant. Now at this point of the game, you've had to battle two bosses. One which takes more effort to lose than win, and the other really wasn't a challenge. You were close to a hotel if you needed healed, and the stores to make you battle ready. But now, you're about to face what is described in the player's guide as the first major enemy you'll encounter on this journey. To sink it, you'll have to use both PSI attacks and regular bash attacks. So we better be prepared for this battle. And the best way to prepare for the battle is to know all about the enemy. But also, much like we were introduced to the sharks as an extension to Frank's difficulty, we have to deal with the caves leading up to Titanic Ant, and they are packed with lots of danger. There are three types of enemies inside of this cave, and they can be fairly difficult. The easiest enemy you fight will be the attack slug. They always attack in groups, but are very weak. Just take them out one at a time and you'll be fine. You may also find black antoids. Be very careful of these, as they like to pack quite a punch. They also tend to come in groups and can deal up to 13 points in damage in every attack. Take them out quickly. Be careful not to confuse antoids with attack slugs when walking around. Both enemies look like little dots on the ground. The final type of enemy is the Rowdy Mouse. This enemy has a tendency to SMASH, often for 13 damage, so be extremely careful. If you find yourself about to run into a group of difficult enemies that you die battling, there's an easy way to change that. Simply walk back and forth through the door you came from to reset the room you're entering. Repeat this until an easier set of enemies appear. Sometimes they just disappear entirely and you can walk through the room unharmed. This is especially useful in tight situations when you have low HP and hamburgers, so use this to your advantage. Now let's talk level. Like previous episodes, I'm going to give you advice based on the bare minimum. I could suggest level 20 to annihilate your enemies, but overgrinding can oftentimes lead to poor gameplay fatigue. With that in mind, I would suggest level 8 or 9 to be a good level. It will still give you a bit of a challenge, but not so much that you will deter you from continuing on. At level 8 or 9, you'll have some good attack and defense power, but you'll also have rock and alpha, and that'll be your best friend, as long as you're still able to use it. To get to level 8 or 9, or more, it's up to you, I would suggest the following. Make your way through the entire first portion of the cave. Walk from the right to the left until you reach the rope ladder. Avoid any, if all, enemies if you can. Also, skip the interior cave parts. We'll come back to those later. There's items inside, but we won't need those for the boss fight, and honestly, it's kind of out of your way. Take the ladder and continue to the second rope ladder on the far right, again avoiding enemies and skipping that cave. Finally, heading to the upper left portion of the cave and exit back to fresh air. If you have made it to this point without dying, you are going to beat Titanic Ann. No problem. And this, listen very closely, please. This is the first of three places in the entire game where you need to grind. Yes, I didn't, I didn't mess that up. There are three places in the entire game that you need to grind. No more, no less. Here is the strategy to grind spot number one. You see, on this little patch of grass, there's guaranteed to be a magic butterfly. Up until this part of the game, you've stumbled upon them randomly, but you've never been in a spot that guarantees that you'll see one, so take it to your advantage. The magic butterfly flying around the outside area of Giant Step will restore 20 psychic points to Ness when he touches it. Since it's guaranteed to spawn in this location, entering the cave and exiting back outside, you'll always find one that reappears. Make use of Ness's heal power, and then restoring his psychic points with his butterfly outside, returning inside, finding enemies, back outside, refill his psychic points, and continue. Repeat this trick while battling enemies inside the cave on your side until you're happy with the level to bring down the damn ant. This, this has, has been, been the end strategy of G2, grind spot number one. Once you've reached the level you're happy with, you're ready to grab that hamburger in the present, if you haven't yet, and continue along the path, climbing two more ropes until you encounter your first sanctuary boss, Titanic Ant. Titanic Ant, known as Giant Ant in Japan, is a guardian of your first sanctuary location, the Giant Step. It resembles a black antoid and was probably altered by the power of the Giant Step, and is accompanied in battle by two black antoids. He stands, to what I imagine, eight feet tall, beaming antennas and razor-sharp claws. He sports a whopping 235 hit points, and plenty of psychic points to deal his specials, which is Shield Alpha and Defense Down Alpha. He has no vulnerability to fire freeze, but this is most likely because it's impossible to have Paula at this point, so incidentally, you can't use those attacks. It is not unlikely for the Titanic Ant to get a smash 
with its more powerful attack, and can destroy Ness with one hit. HP scrolling and hamburgers are your friend in this fight. Immediately start off this battle with Rock and Alpha until you no longer have psychic points. Titanic Ant will use PSI Magnet to steal your psychic points, so you want to use that ability as much as possible. At this point, two black antoids accompany the boss will be destroyed, most likely. Now just keep bashing Titanic Ant and restoring your HP with hamburgers until he is destroyed. Make sure your hit points don't drop below 50 or his biting attack will kill you. After defeating Titanic Ant, you can exit the cave to find your first sanctuary location. The melody will play and your soundstone will record it automatically. What a sweet, sweet victory. You must now head back to Onet, but it might be a good idea to stop and train some more. You'll notice that the enemies all run away from you now. So use this to your advantage by attacking them from behind to gain the upper hand. Go for that green squirrel, cuz. This is an effective way to gain a level and decent amount of money before heading on. This is also a great time to raid the caves that we skipped earlier. You'll find a skip sandwich and a cold remedy in those. Well, you've done it. And I'm getting proud of you. I mean, seriously, soon you'll be ready to take on Gygus himself. It's all just happening so fast. We have just one more Onet boss to tackle before it's on to Tucson. Don't get ahead of yourself yet, because the next boss technically has five forms. You know who I'm talking about the Onet police force, and I'll see you then. We've been talking bosses for three episodes now. We've had a space alien, a gang leader, and a mutated bug. The next logical step would be something even more mutated, right? Well, just when you thought the game had earned your trust, you get thrown quite a curveball. For some reason, a reason never really fully addressed, when you confront the police department about granting you safe passage to the next town, for your world-saving mission, of course, the entire doggone police department tries to kill you, or at least maim you quite hard. This episode of Earthbound Bosses isn't just a single boss, but a five-phase boss that comes to a head with a big baddie, Captain Strong. In order to set up this fight, let's take a step back. When you exit Giant Step and head back to Onet, you'll be stopped by an angry police officer. He wants you to go to the police station. Unfortunately, you're going to have to because the road to the next town is barricaded. Your hands are tied, so you investigate to see what the police needed. If you go straight to the police station, like I imagine most people do on their first run, you may be overtaken by the battle you're getting into, so let's go over some preparation first. Hopefully you've had a chance to level up a bit in the Titanic Ant Cave and you've reached level 10. You'll have barely enough strength to get through at this stage, so if you feel like you'd benefit from a higher level, make sure to level up more. The caves are the best place to do that at this point. Also, you should have a bunch of money and really nothing to spend it on, so make sure you stash up on hamburgers. Once you've checked all those boxes, but before you go to the police station, stop at Frank's, restore your HP and PP, then save at the hotel. The police in Onet have a fairly horrible reputation. They come off arrogant and dismissive after the meteorite crashes. They are known to turn a blind eye on what seems to be the only crime in the town, the sharks. And though it seems to be the only police force, minus the rogue ones in Forsyth, Summers, and Tucson in the entire game, they really do tend to stay hidden away in the station, doing who knows what. Other than these two fools keeping the civilians out of Tucson while watching the sharks do their thing. Even as the game begins, the officers have set up a ridiculous amount of roadblocks following the meteor landing with even one quipping that they are going for the world record. The corrupt police, whatever you want to call them, doesn't seem to sneak up on you if you're paying attention, but it's our time to give them the wake-up call they need. When you enter the police station, talk to Captain Strong, and he'll take you to the back room. At first, it seems as though he's going to give you another key, like the mayor did. Whatever it may be, it seems like an innocent thing for a chief to do. But it's there you'll be attacked by four cops and the captain himself. I'd like to picture this fight, like I mentioned before, as a five-phase boss, rather than just a build-up to a single boss. Anytime you can't recharge between fights, I kind of consider it a single fight with multiple phases. Though the first four cops aren't that challenging, you still want to reserve all your psychic points for Captain Strong. During battle, cops can attack using Crushing Chop, which is a special ability recognized by all cops, as well as Captain Strong, and other rogue policemen that appear in the world. This attack may deal moderate or high damage. Heal with a hamburger if you need to. The best part of each cop fight, in my opinion, is a little smack talk they bring. Like there has to be something said on top of a grown man physically fighting a 13-year-old boy. Either way, they seem to put their efforts into intimidation and not skill. Pretty easy to knock over. The last guy takes off without fighting. He says he's going to call his boss, but then immediately leaves. I'll assume he's going to go tell his wife or something. Finally, the captain will attack. Captain Strong is a stern and powerful commander of the Onet police force, and he can be very tough but fair at times. During the battle, Strong's loss of temper increases his offense by one. He can also use grapple, come out swinging, and execute submission holds, which can deal moderate to high damage as well. Strong can defend, cutting Ness's attack by 50%. Despite claiming to use Super Ultra Mambo Tango Foxtrot martial arts, his most powerful attack is to grapple Ness and use a submission hold. Captain Strong can pack a punch, so be ready to heal whenever you need to. He only has 140 hit points, but no psychic points to speak of. 
And on a side note, I like how the creators don't just give everyone psychic abilities. His submission hold can do a whopping 50 damage, so keep your HP as high as possible throughout the battle. Use PSI Special on to deal a good amount of damage and bash him for the rest of the battle. You may be able to defeat him with two PSI attacks. Heal with a hamburger if you need to. Once defeated, Captain Strong will radio to have the road to Tucson open, ordering the cops to let you through the barricade. Heal up with Frank again and save before moving on. And there you have it, Onet in a nutshell. Four bosses down, 23 to go? Is that right? I don't remember which one I'm counting. Eh, we'll figure it out. So what do you think about the police force? Do you think this is the hardest battle in Onet? If not, which one? Also, which one of the police says the best line before the fight? Let me know in the comments, and I will see you next time when we go to Tucson. And uh, things get weird there. Huh, so you think you're a big shot now, huh? You completed a town and moved on to the next. Therefore, you probably think you're ready to conquer the world. But guess what? It's all just begun. Sure, you've gained some knowledge of what the world of Earthbound might hold, what monsters look in the shadows. But I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Things are about to get weird. Oh, that was just the beginning. My favorite town, actually. But up next is a new beast, both unfamiliar to us as a player and Ness as a character, a proverbial stepping out of one's comfort zone. And rather than just a generic calling to head south, you now have a mysterious person calling for you, beckoning for your help. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a step back. Before I talk boss, whom I haven't even named yet, I'll list off some game-enhancing finds around Tucson. The first thing to do when you arrive is to rent a bicycle from the bike shop in the northern part of town. It's free, and honestly, you only get a very, very short time in the game to use it, so take your time to enjoy it. It also allows you to move quicker. If you don't care to use it, you could always store it with Escargo Express. Maybe you want to save it for the end of the game to use. Head to the hotel and walk all the way to the western wall, talking to the man sitting at the table over and over again. Eventually, he'll give you 50 bucks. While there, go ahead and rest. Someone named Paula will be calling you in your dreams. On the way out, call your mom. If you don't call her or visit every so often, you'll get homesick, which can affect your performance in battle. Keep this in mind throughout the rest of the game. Find Mock Pizza and get their phone number. Now you can call them anytime to order pizza, which is helpful if you need food while away from a town. Try and take a bus to Threed, and a bunch of ghosts will stop you in the tunnel, forcing the bus to turn back. Guess you can't leave Tucson yet. Meanwhile, it'll be a good idea to gain a few levels by fighting New Age Retro Hippies, Unassuming Local Guys, Cranky Ladies, and Annoying Old Party Men around town. They're fairly easy to beat, and they give you a good amount of experience. Rest in the hotel if you need to recover. Talk to the group of guys by the theater called the Runaway Five. Apparently, they're in a great deal of debt. Next, you want to head over to Polestar Preschool and talk to Paul's parents. Turns out she's been missing, so naturally, you're going to want to find her. Don't forget to check upstairs for the teddy bear. These stuffed bears will sometimes take hits in your place, potentially saving your life. Head over to Berglund Park to buy a for sale sign and a copper bracelet. Now, the for sale sign can be used to sell items without having to be in a department store. It's handy because that way you don't have to drop any items while you're out of town. If you aren't using it again, go ahead and store that with Escargo Express. Want some easy cash? Here's a tip for you. Buy a couple fresh eggs at Berglund Park. If you wait around long enough, they'll turn into chickens and you can sell them back for 98 bucks more than what you spend on them. Repeat this process until you're tired of it for a head start on having some extra money to spend. It'll be a good idea to train while we wait for the eggs hatch too. Okay, so that covers most of the housekeeping early Tucson. You've done what you needed to do. Now it's time to move forward. Head to the far left side of Bergman Park. There you'll find a hustler and thief whom attacks Ness on sight, initiating combat by leaping off the roof of his hideout. And this brings us to this episode's boss, Everdread. Everdread, whose full name is Al Everdread, according to the Player's Guide, is a husky, middle-aged man with a small black hat, glasses, and mustache. He wears what looks like an orange Hawaiian shirt, his Japanese name, Tonchiki Tonchiki, 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 means dimwit, numbskull, cretin, dingbat, dum-dum, loggerhead, dolt, fool. You get the point. Now, we don't know Everdread's intentions until after you battle him, so let's cover that first. Everdread has some strong attacks, but if you have high enough level, this should be fairly easy. Use PSI rocking twice to dwindle his life down. If he's not dead, either use PSI rocking again or start bashing him until he falls. Keep your HP above 50 by eating food items or using PSI life up. Everjet will sometimes steal food items from you, like that spiteful crow did back in Onet. In battle, he occasionally wastes his turn as he knits his brow or has a big grin on his face. His standard attack and biting attack can deal moderate to high damage. Once defeated, Everdread starts talking about what led him to this moment. Yeah, I'm Everdread, boss of Berglin Park. When I jumped off the roof, I twisted my ankle. Anyway, I lost and nothing will change that. You know you're pretty strong. Yeah, I know that you want to find out about a girl named Paula. She went off to a secret lair in Peaceful Rest Valley. A chubby boy and a weird guy in a blue outfit have kidnapped her, though. They said that they're going to make Paula some sort of human sacrifice. 
They were definitely hardcore strange. You know, she might be gone already. You better hurry. If you save Paula, be sure to come back here, okay? Don't forget. It is unsure if Carpenter, who was the weird guy in the blue outfit Elle described, rented the cabin from Everdred or simply used it without his permission, even though Everdred is aware it's being used. He seems reluctant to oppose the usage of the cabin, probably because he finds the members involved in the cult hardcore strange and is intimidated by them. Regardless, it's up to you to rescue Paula and restore the status quo. Not to get ahead of things, but after Ness rescues Paula, Everjet offers to make Ness his partner, though the criminal knows Ness will turn it down. Instead, he gives Ness a wad of bills, totaling of $10,000 in cash. That'll be what you use to pay for the release of the Runaway Five. Here's a little, little tidbit for you. When you return to Everjet, if Paula happens to be unconscious, Everjet will tell you to talk to her parents, and he will say, come back when you have actually accomplished something. It's kind of funny. I don't know. Next time you see Al Everdred is in Foreside, which is two cities from now, where he's laying wounded outside of Jackie's Cafe. Now, part of me thinks that Everdred and Frank Fly may have crossed paths at sometimes, maybe work together. I don't know. Nothing in-game points to that, but seeing that they both live fairly close, are both sketchy figureheads that eventually help the party. I don't know. I feel a similar vibe between them. Also, I should note that Everdred has an unconscious sprite in the game code that we never see in the actual game. Some people have speculated that he may have been part of your party for a short while in early drafts of the game. So there you go, our first Tucson boss and some fairly heavy plot points leading forward. Everdread isn't the biggest of heavy hitters like a Sanctuary boss might be, but a rookie player might still have some issues with him, so don't underestimate his abilities. With a little practice and the right level, you'll be fine. Give me a comment down below letting me know what you think of Everdread, or maybe something you've learned from this video. If you like this series, think about subscribing. We have like 20 more of these episodes coming up, so there's plenty of content for you. Well, see you next Friday for when we confront Paula's captor, Mr. Carpenter. It has gotten real! Sorry, that was quite abrasive for the start of a video. Let me take that again. Shit has gotten real! Yeah, okay, there's no other way of doing that. Last time I left you, we broke down Everdread. A guy similar to some we've seen before that gave us a direction to head to save a girl. Pretty believable and innocent, right? Well, the next boss is not only hidden away in a mountain village, far beyond any sort of safe haven, but we've flipped a switch from quote-unquote normal to, well, I'll say it, weird. I'm talking about the cult leader who hopes to sacrifice a little girl for sport, Mr. Carpainter. A lot is about to happen in this game. For me, when I was a kid, this was the part of the game that stumped me the most. There are like a dozen or so steps between arriving in Tucson and moving towards 3, and I could never really nail down the order. Though I've run the game dozens of times, I still need to take a step back and remember what's going on. We've spoken to Everdread, he tells us to head to Happy Happy Village and save Paula. We find out that means we need to head east. Don't do that yet. We have something to do first. Head down the long road that leads towards three. On the top of that road, you'll find two inventors that live side by side, Orange Kid and Apple Kid. One of them is super hot, but a horrible inventor. And the other one isn't easy on the eyes, but in turn creates some of the world's most useful inventions. If you talk to each of them, they require $200 to complete an invention they're working on. If you give it to Orange Kid, he'll give you his Saporma, a device that promises to spread peace and goodwill, which breaks the moment you try to use it. So clearly save your money and toss it at Apple Kid. Apple Kid will also require some food, so spend like two bucks on a condiment at Berglund Park and invest in his work. His mouse buddy will give you a receiver phone as a thank you, and that's a really useful item in this game. Once you've done this, you're ready to head into Peaceful Rest Valley. Once there, head as far north as you can, avoiding enemies. Check the pencil statue and go back into Tucson. Upon returning through the caves, Apple Kid will call you on your receiver phone and tell you his invention is ready. Head to the southern part of Berglund Park to get the pencil eraser, then save. I can't stress that enough, and return to Peaceful Rest Valley. Peaceful Rest Valley, which is known in Japan as Grateful Dead Valley, which had to be changed due to copyright issues, is an enigma. It is vast, especially for a first-time player. It's filled with brutal enemies that pop up in some tight areas that make it virtually impossible to despawn them, and it's just a pit of anxiety, really. Your best bet is to avoid every single enemy, literally all of them. Avoid them all. The robots can give you a cold, which forces you to use your precious PP to heal. The Territorial Oak are, in my opinion, the scariest enemy in the game. Since even if you get lucky and get a big smash and beat it in one hit, they do serious, unavoidable damage when they explode. And those damn trees blend in so well with the environment that even on my latest run making this video, they had me accidentally wander too close. The only good thing, and I mean the only good thing, is a little girl right at the beginning. She'll pay you money to take the mushroom off your head when you get mushroomized, where you normally have to pay to get it taken away. That is the only thing about Peaceful Rest Valley. Okay, got it? Sure, you can wander off the path and open up a couple of useful presents, but if you're not a veteran, just go through the map as fast as you can. And here's a tip to do that. The bridges are your guide. Stay below the top bridge 
and above the bottom bridge for the quickest path. It varies slightly off course, but generally that's a good rule of thumb. That'll keep you from veering too far off course. Also, I thought it was interesting that no matter when you come back to Peaceful Rest Valley, aside from the post-plot portion, the music never gets happy. It is eternally a shitty place. Avoid it like the plague. Finally, you made it to Happy Happy Village, and it's really all but that. Though it just recently became a cult compound, its layout resembles a stereotypical cult compound, if that makes any sense. The buildings give off a historic Salem, Massachusetts architecture feel. You know what I'm saying? There are five residences, three you can enter, one that serves as a hotel, and one that houses a clearly terrified Mr. Saturn. The upper right corner has a shop and a small market slash tablecloth with some small items, and you can repeat the egg trick from last episode if you'd like. There are two caves, one that leads to Paula, which we'll cover shortly, and the other leads to a second sanctuary spot, which we'll cover next video. In the center of town, you'll find a town hall, which is currently filled with all the cult members, and there are hundreds. Before you start and make your way through town hall, you'll need some protection. Head to the shop and buy laced equipment for nests. Then enter the cave to the left of the shop. You may run into cultists there. Avoid them. There really isn't any reason to grind or battle anyone in the whole area. On the other side of the cave, you'll find a shack that you saw on the cliff in Peaceful West Valley. Inside is our girl Paula, who is eagerly waiting her hero Ness to arrive. She confirms our dreams and knows the only way to free her is to fight the carpenter. She'll give you the all-powerful Franklin badge and you'll be on your way. But first, walk back and forth and watch her follow you. This, of course, serves no purpose, but it's fun. And sometimes, all you need is a little fun. Outside, you run into Pokey, and he forces you into a battle with a couple enemies. Knock them out and head back to Happy Happy Village. Save the shop and visit the hotel if needed. It's a $50 stay for the night. Once you're refreshed, you're ready to go head-to-head -head with the car painter. If this is the first time in the big town hall, it may be a bit overwhelming, but if you follow this pattern, it'll be really easy. You can somewhat see where the cultists will move when you speak to them, but this picture helps too. Once you've weaved your way through, avoiding all presence until after the battle, you'll run into my favorite NPC in the whole game. He screams for no reason, and it cracks me up every time. Please say hi to him for me whenever you walk past, if you wouldn't mind. In the next room, which I'm pretty sure is the tower part of the building, maybe, is where you finally run into Mr. Carpainter. Mr. Carpainter is the leader of the Happy Happiest Cult and the second owner of the evil Manny Manny statue after buying it from its discoverer, Liar X Adrate. While under the influence of the statue, he believes the key to happiness is to paint everything in the world blue, which he starts with Happy Happy Village. He makes Pokey Minch into his right-hand man. He orders him and a masked boy to kidnap Paula so she can become a high priestess, even though Everdread claims that she was actually to be a human sacrifice, which I kind of believe. I have an entire video about the Manny Manny statue, and I think it's one of my favorites I've created. It goes into depth of all the influences the Manny Manny statue has on Earthbound. I'll link it in this video so you can check it out. I highly recommend it, not just because it's a video of mine, but because it really reveals a massive second plot in the game. Mr. Carpainter has 262 hit points and 70 psychic points. He fights using a crashing boom bang, which essentially is PSI Thunder Beta, which gets deflected through the use of the Franklin Badge. He can also deal damage using paint attacks, which inflicts significantly more damage than those of the insane cultists. He is additionally able to shield and heal himself, which is kind of a pain. If Ness attempts to confront him before obtaining the Franklin Badge from Paula, Carpenter's lightning strikes makes Ness warp back to Happy Happy Village. The fight is fairly easy. As long as you keep your HP above 40, you should have any issues at all. You may even get lucky, and all he uses is crashing booms, and he essentially kills himself. After he's defeated by Ness, he apologizes and says that ever since he got the Manny Manny statue, he's been doing weird things. He gives Ness the key to the cottage Paul is imprisoned in and disbands the happy, happy cultists. You can walk through the town hall area freely now. Grab the two presents if you want and talk to the three confused ex-cultists for fun. Happy Happy Village is returned to a nice place to live, and now you can use the hotel for free. Since you'll be in this area for a little bit longer, have some fun and talk to the NPCs. They'll have some pretty good pre- and post-brainwashing dialogue. Well, that's it. Another boss done and another video in the bag. Hope you're enjoying this process as much as I am. I love dissecting this game even after playing it dozens of times. I hope to see everyone next time for our next boss and second sanctuary guardian, the Mondo Mole. Hey, everyone. Last time I went into great detail talking about the journey to Happy Happy Village and things to look out for. I broke down the early steps to getting to where we are now, but the next step to the next boss is only a cave away. But I'm also going to break down the boss differently. Oh yeah, you're probably wondering what the boss is, assuming you haven't read the title or paid any attention to what you clicked on, but it's Mondo Mole. Most bosses that we've seen or will see come in a package deal. You have their environment leading up to them and a slew of monsters to go with. But our pal Mondo is no different. City of Happy Happy Village is once again a peaceful place. It was previously taken over by a villainous cult leader whose ideology was to paint the town blue in order to reach a higher power. But luckily, since then, things have calmed down quite a bit. It is entirely your fault that the town is saved and you should take the time to wander around and talk to everybody. Modestly, of course. Because most of them are selfishly focused on their own mistakes and don't take the time to worship you. 
What you gonna do? Once you've spoken to everyone and graffitied the houses, make your way to the general store up top. Get Paula her frying pan and equip her charms and bracelets. If you haven't picked up on the signs yet, by the way, when it's flashing like this, that means you can benefit from that upgrade. If it doesn't flash, then your character can use the item, but it won't increase your current stats by equipping it. And if it appears to be blacked out, then your character cannot use that item at all. Just, just a little tidbit in case you didn't know. Once equipped, you're ready to head to the caves. Now, please note, if this is your first time taking on these caves, Paula will die multiple times. I'm just saying. So familiarize yourself with where the hotel is and where the doctor's office is. And try not to get frustrated. You're heading into a cave with enemies aimed at Ness's level 16, Paula's level 1. If she gets hit, majority of the time it will be critical, and that's why I'm here to lay out the best way to get ready. Head inside the caves. Now I've split the cave into four parts. The cave intro, tough stretch 1, recovery zone slash butterfly room, and tough stretch 2. The cave intro is just as it sounds. It gets you ready for the easier enemies and shields you from harder enemy spawns. As soon as you get into the cave, 75% of the time you'll see a mole laying rough above you. If it's there, it's unavoidable. Battling it right away will increase Paula's level from 1 to 4. You can choose to grind for a bit here. In case Paula dies, you don't have to backtrack too much to heal her. If you want to take the grinding route, however, I would suggest walking the full length of the first section. The reason for that is there's a present with a great charm below the entrance that is really helpful. In the same section, you will most likely find a bunch of bats, so use PSI Rockin' to take them out in a group. You should have Paul's teddy bear following you that can help you absorb some blows. If you'd like to heal up entirely by leaving and going to the hotel, do that now. If you're confident in your abilities, it's time to head to section 2. By this time, at level 2 actually, Paula will have learned Freeze Alpha. It's going to be your best friend. Don't be afraid to deplete your psychic points, we can get more coming up. Entering section 2, you will notice a new enemy, the Mighty Bear. They pack a punch, but you're not scared. They are an experience point gold mine after all. Start a battle with it, and I believe they, they always end up alone. Ness makes sure he bashes, and Paula have her use Freeze Alpha. It should only take one turn to topple a not-so-mighty bear. Repeat this process as long as you're comfortable. You may even get lucky, and one of the bears, one in 64 actually, may drop a teddy bear to bring with you. Once you're ready to move on, head on to Section 3. Section 3 is your saving grace. Most major dungeons or caves have a butterfly room, and this is this cave's. A butterfly is almost always guaranteed to spawn in the top alcove. Use it to replenish your PP and heal up your party. You're about to head into the toughest part of the cave, so get to 100%. I wouldn't suggest intentionally fighting any enemies in Section 4. It is typically full of enemies of all varieties, bats, moles, bears, and they will do everything in their power to knock you down before your big battle. I normally take the lower path, where it splits by the water. There seems to be less enemies this way, but once you clear the water, it is a longer sprint to Mondo Mole. If you take the upper path and can avoid enemies, you'll have less distance to cover if you should have to dodge enemies. This little pocket of last stitch enemies can be a doozy, so don't forget to try and unspawn enemies if you need to. If successful, you're ready to fight the big man himself, Mondo Mole. Mondo Mole has 498 hit points and will give you almost 5,800 experience points when defeated. He is a boss that guards the second Your Sanctuary location and appears to be an oversized mutated mole playing rough. He has some brutal attacks that include physical attacks, attacking, which is a low power attack, and tore into you, and clawed with sharp nails, which are high powered attacks. He also has the ability to heal himself and can set up a PSI shield. Mondomole takes half damage from PSI fire, quarter damage from PSI freeze. We've gotten used to the amount of damage freeze alpha does to the bears, but it is no use here. Paula should only use PSI thunder, which you should have at this point. It has a low accuracy rate, but when it hits, it's worth it. If you don't approach with the right strategy, you will be taken down. Making this video, I got pulverized twice, so don't think that you're exempt just because you've done it before. Your best bet to a quick painless fight is for Ness to use Paralyze, believe it or not. If it works, Mondo Mole will not be able to attack, and you can wail on him until he's dead. Flash can also be affected, but it isn't as accurate. Hopefully the Earthbound Gods have smiled upon you, and you kill him in the first round. If not, rinse and repeat, you'll get it. Head to your next sanctuary and move forward with life. Some of you may already know, but Mondo Mole isn't even required at this part of the game. Yeah, no kidding. You will need to get the sanctuary to progress the plot later in the game, but you can come back at level 40 and obliterate the cave if you want. But that's no fun, and it requires a significant amount of backtracking. Also, in the same vein, if you choose to defeat the car painter, get Paula, and head back to Tucson without killing the mole, and start the Runaway 5 storyline, they will offer to give you a ride to Threed. At this time in the game, no enemies spawn. If you take advantage of it, head all the way back to Mondo Mole Cave. Starting a fight with Mondo Mole will softlock the game, and you'll have to restart your system. So don't do that. Deal? And there you have it, Mondo Mole. Probably one of the most difficult bosses so far, unless you paralyze him, right? But you've done it, and you've made me even more proud than normal. Enjoy your victory, but don't celebrate too much. We're heading into a world of excitement coming up, and you need to be in your best mind. We'll cover a lot of ground in the next episode, so get some sleep and dream of the boogie tent.
Last time, I left you with a corpse of a mole at your feet. Figuratively, of course, I, I hope. We fought our way through the hard parts of Tuus and Anonet. We've grown as a team and mentally as a warrior. And now it's part for a lesser known, we'll call it a lesser cared about boss, the Boogie Tent. Now, if you're playing through the game for the first time with these videos, like I assume all of you are, then you're most likely confused about what tent you're supposed to be fighting, right? I mean, you're standing right outside of a cave in the middle of a village in the middle of the mountains, far away from Tucson, which is a town that has nothing even close to resembling a tent, except these. So where is this next boss, you say? Well, in short, it's far, far away. But since this is a boss series and not a playthrough, I'm going to turbocharge our way through the next few steps of the game to give some depth to our story. With that said, I'm going to need everyone to buckle in their seats, wherever you are, and hold on, because we're going fast. After you leave the mole cave, heal up and head back towards Peaceful Rest Valley. As you remember, I hate it here. You'll also notice that the bridge has been repaired by the ex-cult member, so you don't have to travel as long on your way back to Tucson. Once back in town, head to the preschool, reunite Paula with her family, who was previously devastated by her disappearance. They will immediately let her leave again, this time on an adventure around the entire known world and through time itself. Ah, the 90s, when you didn't even need a permission slip to cross dimensions. Once the tears have dried, head to Bergman Park and chat with Everdread again. He'll give you 10 grand. Take that to the Runaway 5 manager after seeing them perform. Pay him, and he will release the Runaway Five from their contract, and they will play one last show at the Chaos Theater before offering you a ride to the next town. The noise of their noisy band bus will drown out the warnings from the ghosts, and the entire crew now has access to Threed. Hooray! However, the, ca the celebration is cut short when a couple seconds into the town, the Runaway Five decide that they'll drop off the characters and let them fend for themselves. No big deal, 10 grand just doesn't get you as far as it used to. From here, you explore the town. Check out the circus in the middle town, knock on all the doors of the scared residents, and when you're ready to move on with the plot, head to the upper left corner of the map. Traveling through the cemetery, aka ground zero of the most concentrated area of enemies in the game, finally you'll end up at two zombies that are blocking you from going any further. Talking to them will cue the plot point music, and you're free to return back to town. When you approach a hotel, you'll notice a unique looking woman who seems to be drawing attention to herself. You follow her because she's literally a hooker in a kid's game, and it's then that you're bamboozled into being attacked and locked up by the zombies. Our two characters wake up in prison cell below the cemetery with no way of escaping, and would have totally been doomed if it wasn't for Paula and her amazing ability to, to telepathically communicate with people miles and miles and miles away. So, Paula's call falls upon the nerdy inventor living up north in winters, Jeff. He is stirred awake in the middle of the night and is overwhelmed by the need to travel south. With the help of his friend and eventual lover, Tony, Jeff gets all his equipment and is helped over the fence to freedom. His first stop is the general store where he gets a piece of gum from a strange woman, and the gum attracts a monkey who is just standing at the door minding its own business. When Jeff gives the monkey a simple piece of gum, the monkey becomes a lifelong friend and temporarily joins Jeff's team. Side note, in the area between the boarding school and the lake to the south is the greatest place to grind some goats. They are quite intimidating on your first run through because of their power, but each battle gives you 20 experience points. That adds up quick, so grind them goats. The two head south until they reach a large lake and presumably a dead end. But, with a little shut eye and a wind advisory, our small monkey friend turns into a lake monster magnet. And before you know it, we're riding in the head of a Tessie across the lake. It's all normal. Please, just let it happen. On the other side of the lake, you meet my personally favorite character in the game, the Dungeon Man. His first dungeon is nothing to call home about, but he has a great attitude and he'll get better. Make sure you get all the packages and smartly fight all the bosses. It's a big hike back if you die. A bit further, you reach a cave that you just passed through for now. You'll come back when you have more firepower. Exiting the cave will lead you to parting with your monkey friend. He, like most of your friends in the past, has left you to seek the attention of a lady. It's okay, you'll end up just fine. I would suggest being bold and fighting at least one of the cavemen around Stonehenge Base. If you grind the goats early, you should have enough strength. And if you grab the bottle rocket in the last cave, you'll have a shoe in during battle. Also, do not use the big bottle rocket Jeff has had since we started playing with him. You'll use that shortly. Finishing the journey south and finally reuniting with your dad, he will almost immediately ship you even further away so that he doesn't have to worry about you anymore. Ah, I'm just kidding. You know, it's a dad thing. We love you, but we just don't know how to express it all the way, all the time. Whatever. So Jeff is on his way zipping through the sky in a repurposed spaceship, and he comes crashing down hard right on top of where Ness and Paula have been captured. They exchange greetings, and Jeff uses his broken key machine that he got from the boarding school, and the three team up and escape and head back to town. Now, if you haven't forgotten, you are watching a video about bosses. Just a friendly reminder. Did you remember? Okay, cool. It's now that we meet our new boss. Walking around the city, your first instinct is to head to the southern portion of town. It is there you see a second circus tent that's popped up. Intriguing. Once you get close, however, you realize that it is not a tent, but some sort of creature that has disguised itself as a tent, and you are pulled into battle with the boogie tent. 
Not much is known about the boogie tent, other than it's used to store Master Belch's favorite food, fly honey, and it appears spontaneously in Threed. Its sprite is similar to the Squatter Demon, which we will see towards the end of the game, and the theorizing part of me feels like it's some sort of connection. Perhaps a Squatter Demon, like its name suggests, is an entity that takes the place of something else. In this case, a tent. And when we see it later in the game, that might be its raw form. The form that we fight when it reveals itself. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe that's a video for a different time. In this battle, the boogie tech can use pale green light, which acts as a neutralizer, canceling the PSI effect on itself and all the members of the party. It could also immobilize a fly uh, party member by splitting fly honey at him or her. Simply bash onto a party member for minor damage. Use defense spray to boost its defense and use PSI flash alpha. Boogie tent is vulnerable to PK fire and brain shock. But I'm going to level with you. If you have that big bottle rocket that Jeff came with, then use that to end the battle in one hit. The boogie tent has 579 hit points and a big bottle rocket, which is a strength of five bottle rockets, just so you know, can do up to 750 damage. It can, in most cases, result in a one hit kill. If you don't have the big bottle rocket, have Paul use fire alpha and Jeff and Ness bash until it's dead. It won't be a problem. I haven't been grinding very much in this latest run through and it was no issue defeating it. After defeating it, the trash can containing fly honey is revealed, being the key item required to defeat Master Belch. He's, he's coming up in a little bit. And there you go. It's the journey that was a hard part in this case. So it was nice to have a relaxed boss for the while after all that work. Next time, we will have to begin our journey to stopping Master Belch. But before, we run into his tunnel guard and next boss, Mini Barf. See you there. Hello Earthbound lovers and welcome to another episode of Bosses of Earthbound. Today we may not be covering as much ground physically, but there's sure a lot of information packed into a small journey. So let's not get too scared as we climb down below the cemetery and eventually confront Many Barf. Last time we defeated Boogie Tent, a being that would disguise itself as a circus tent in the hopes of killing us and presumably trapping us forever inside its bowels. But since we aren't anyone to mess with, we easily defeated the tent and in turn gained an unlikely weapon that is going to take down a killer threat. The group, there's now three, when they first arrived in three, we had no reason or explanation of why this town in particular was swarming with zombies. Well, it turns out that one of Gygus' top dogs, Master Belch, has through some sort of magic raised the zombies in this massive cemetery to keep anyone who might try and reach and destroy him out. Knowing that and now obtaining what turns out to be Master Belch's favorite treat, we must find our way past the zombie army, and more importantly, and specifically, the two zombies that are hanging around the entrance to the catacombs beneath the cemetery. Head to the main circus tent that's centered in town. Once there, begin talking to the people. They'll mention a need to capture the zombies and dance around ideas on how to cure the town. Speaking with them is enough to trigger the next game event. Walking around town, you'll receive a call from Apple Kid, who has a new invention in the works. It is similar to flypaper, but captures zombies instead of insects. Not sure how he knew to create such a thing, but he's a smart one, so let's leave that to him. A couple steps later, an Escar ghost shows up dropping off your item. If you need to clear an inventory spot, do it before they show up or your game will explode into flames and you'll have to summon a witch doctor to break the curse. Either that or it'll go into your Excargo Express inventory. I can't remember which one, so either way, free up a slot. Once you have the zombie paper, go back into the tent and use it. Doesn't matter where, as long as you are inside the tent, it'll work. Then go take a nap at the hotel, watch a little video of the zombies heading inside. This is when Jeff will also repair any broken items if his level is high enough. When you exit the hotel, you can either go check out the zombies in the tent, some of them have some funny dialogue, or you can head to the northwest part of the map and go to the ladder that is no longer being guarded. Note that there are still enemies that can hurt you. It doesn't really make sense. All the zombies were brought to the tent, but there are still, you know, overworld zombie and enemies and all that. Once you descend the ladder, you are in the dungeon of Mini Barf. There's a series of rooms coming up that have a variety of zombie enemies, some you've seen on the surface. They include zombie dogs, zombies, no good flies, and zombie possessors. They're all bad and none of them are worth fighting. Seriously, there's no reason to grind in this part. You'll, you'll, you'll need all your strength. So you want to use the trick where you despawn enemies in the doorway. And make sure you go in either a barely guarded or a completely empty room. Now, there's no need to really level up at this point, so don't even worry about it. In the first big room, you'll get a skip sandwich deluxe. Continue up the second set of stairs and it'll lead you to another big room. Again, despawn when needed. But also note that when you go back to despawn the enemies, they may appear in the hallway, like the steps area, so be careful. Once you get in the second room, open the casket, randomly laying in the middle of the floor, and you'll find a silver bracelet, which is clutch. Next is another set of stairs that typically doesn't have any enemies on them, and after that, your last room, your stairs that lead to the star of this video, Mini Barf. The Mini Barf appears as a small pile of red, violet puke. It is one of Master Belch's henchmen, and an extension one of Gygus' minions. He's the last line of defense between the catacombs and the Great Fruit Falls Valley ahead. The slimy monster almost mistakes Ness and his company for allies due to the jar of fly honey. 
but then discovers that they are Belch's mortal enemies and attacks them. His dialogue is, Did you have the fly, honey? <laughs> okay. Did you have some fly, honey? I consider you a friend. But actually, you're just a commoner. I am a more enemy of your kind. What do you think? Does that sound? Is that gun? During the battle, its most annoying attack is Stinky Breath, which can inflict an entire party with uncontrollable crying. The mini barf can also immobilize a target with mucus or lower their stats with a terrible odor. BSI fire is the best weapon against it. The fight isn't that difficult, but it can take time if you keep missing due to the mini barf's attack, like the uncontrollable crying. If you've reached the battle with relatively high HP from not getting into many battles, you should be in good shape. Keep your party healed. Once defeated, he'll mention that he was just wanted a little fly honey snack, and then he'll evaporate into the great beyond. Climb up the ladder and end the scary part of the game. But don't celebrate yet. You will have a fair amount of danger up ahead, but we'll get into that in the next video. And there you have it. A very minor, almost unthought about boss, but a necessary one and a nice little boost of experience points. Next time, we will have to answer to Papa Bear, who was one of Gygus' biggest baddies. He stinks, he's slimy, he's literal vomit, it's Master Belch! Alright, thanks guys for watching. Bit of a shorter episode, but that's okay. Next week we'll have a long one. This video is dedicated to those who have stuck around this far in the series. Wading through those mini bosses all this way is about to pay off. We have a heavy hit in our midst. Not only does he command zombies and enslave geniuses, but he also has direct contact with the big guy himself, Gygus. A blob of vomit that needs no introduction. The goop from Grapefruit Falls. The vomit with an attitude. Mr. Putrid himself. I'm talking about the mush, the myth, the legend. Give it up for Master Belch. Oh yeah! Before we get into the meat and potatoes of just who this powerhouse is, let's get from last episode to the big man's dungeon or factory, however you want to refer to it. At the end of Mini Barf episode, we emerged from the catacombs beneath Threed and were once again greeted by sunlight, but it was an unfamiliar place. Known as the Great Fruit Falls area, we are tasked to head north blindly. There we encounter some fairly horrible beasts. Armored frog, farm zombies, red antoids, black antoids, and plain crocodiles. Personally, I try to avoid each and every enemy here. For one, you may still be licking your wounds from the catacombs, but also the enemies are not anything to bat an eye at. They're tough cookie. Do your best to despawn enemies, but be careful. It's easy for another group of enemies to pop up when you're trying the trick. For reference, your halfway point is when you find a present. It contains a bomb, which will come in great handy later. Once you've reached the cave, head in immediately. No use to explore north yet. Travel through the cave and arrive at some of the best characters in the game. When I first arrived here as a kid, in the pre-internet world, I had no idea what to expect. I had never seen a Mr. Saturn before, and the music was so far removed from the rest of the soundtrack that I felt as though I was being pulled into an entirely different game. I made a video before explaining the entire story of the Mr. Saturn, which I will of course link to, but for now, all you need to know is that they are kind, simple folk, and are also incredibly intelligent. You learn from them that some of their people have gone missing and are being enslaved nearby. By. An evil force is exploiting their smarts. They were forced to construct a factory of evil nearby, but one Mr. Saturn reveals a built-in fail-safe password of sorts that enables you to entry without force. All you need to do is check the door behind a group of balls and wait for three minutes. A very clever game mechanic in my opinion. But before you do that, however, let's make sure we have a pretty good idea of what the Saturn Valley can offer. There are four presents slash garbage cans around town. Three are in the cave that are dead center and ground level. You'll find a protractor, which you can sell, sudden guts pills, which is great in a battle, and a broken spray gun, which Jeff can hang on to. There is also a present at the top of the ladder to the right of the garbage can cave. There are three visible huts in town. A yellow one in the ground, which is where the town leader lives. He revives your party if they're passed out and heals any issues that you may have contracted during battle. The second house is a pink one in the ground level. It's a hotel and save spot. The third and final house is a pink one perched on the hill. There you will find a shop. You'll actually use this shop for the rest of the game. It has secret herbs which heal your remedies and even bring back a fallen ally, if it works that is. Heal up and stay the night. Make sure to put your big boy or girl pants on as well and it's showtime. Head back through the caves and this time head north towards the waterfall. Avoid your enemies you run into as best as you can. Once you get to the waterfall, after you fuzzy pickle, check the door and literally put your controller down and go get a snack. That's it, you're in. Now you can see just how advanced this quote quote dungeon is. First off, of all the boss quarters, you'll see this is the most advanced one. Even Stonehenge base later in the game doesn't seem to be so elaborate. The steel walls and metal walkways are not at all inviting. But you know who is inviting? The little pile of ick. The guard, who most likely let you in to begin with, won't leave your side to make sure you don't spill any of this precious honey. Now I'm gonna pause the video here. For those who've been watching since the beginning, you'll remember that I referenced three places in the entire game you need to grind. The first spot was in Titanic Ant's Cave, and now we've reached the second spot. You see those enemies? These are called Foppies. They're going to be your best friend. They're weak, 
They barely hurt you, and they are drenched in experience points. Fight these mofos to your heart's content. Don't be afraid to use PP attacks either because, you guessed it, there is a butterfly room coming up. Grind as much as you want. If you're feeling really brave, why don't you just grind up to level 99? Nah, I'm, I'm kidding. Don't do that. It'll take you 3,000 years. But if you haven't been grinding up to this point, now is your chance. On either side of the floppy domain, there are doors. The top one will give you a bomb, and the bottom one will give you an IQ capsule. Both are guarded by zombies, so pursue it at your own risk. They are a bit heavier hitters than the floppies. Once you're done with the foppy smashing, head to the center of the factory. This is also the saddest part of the map, where you see the poor little Mr. Saturns are working away at jarring and inspecting the fly honey jars. Moving on, the ladder will take you up to a room filled with garbage cans. The vital capsule, HP sucker, and calorie stick, all worth it. The door at the bottom of the ladder is the butterfly room. Heal and replenish your PP. It is in this next span, what's called the sludge garden, that all your grinding will pay off. This area is littered with slimy little piles that are not as friendly as the foppy's counterpart, and should be avoided at all cost. They are famous, even to elite players, as death traps because of how often they ask for help and another pile enters the fight. Avoid them, or if you're dragged into a fight, don't underestimate them by any means. Finally, the next room will reveal the big man himself, Master Belch. Now, aside from being the poster child of the game, the first track of the original soundtrack, he was also hugely behind the game marketing back in the 90s. The player's guide featured scratch and sniff Snickers with the tagline, this game stinks. For some reason, they thought it would be good way to sell games back then. That might have been riding the coattails of the Garbage Pail Kids, now that I think about it. Who knows? In typical Big Bad fashion, Master Belch has an opening tough guy monologue. <laughs> so you're Ness, I see. So you're Ness, I see. So you're Ness, I see. <laughs> that was a pro- That was a pro- So you're Ness. So you're Ness, I see. There is a prophecy that a boy will destroy Master Gygus. <laughs> you make me laugh so hard. If Master Gygus is scared of someone, he would have to be worse than the greatest evil. <laughs> I'll take you down big time. Get ready for the worst fight of your life. <laughs> Get ready to feel the pain of true nausea. <laughs> Come on, let's go. I don't know if that was good or not. Comment, that was the best voice I've ever heard in the whole world, times 10, if that was good. Master Belch is a large, animated pile of vomit who was one of Gygus' most esteemed minions. He is addicted to fly honey and is in command of many small piles of vomit. And his name implies he belches repeatedly while speaking. And that sound even appears in his battle theme called Battle Against Belch. Though he seems intimidating, he actually is a pushover. If you do it right, that is. You have the fly honey in hand. Use it. You must give Belch the jar of fly honey, otherwise the fight will be going on forever. Once you use the fly honey, he isn't dangerous at all and will hardly attack. You can take your time beating him up now that he is concentrating on wolfing down the fly honey. However, you should use PSI Fire and PSI Freeze to make it a quicker ordeal. It's really crazy how he talks so much game and as soon as you give him the fly honey, he just he just becomes a, well, a, a bush. But say you are a masochist and want to spend all day in battle. Belch's moveset includes burp and blow, nausea breath, which hurts one party, makes him nauseous. Call for help, which may summon slimy little piles of the battle. Start a continuous attack, which deals multiple hits of damage to one party member. And he edges closer, which does no damage. There's actually a way to defeat Master Belch without fly honey, though you must have luck to do so. Generally, at the beginning of every run-in, he'll blow his nauseating breath at you. If you use PK Flash and make him feel strange, and then he blows his breath and makes himself feel nauseous, that's the way to do it. Because the main reason why you usually use Fly Honey is that before you use it, any attack on him, you will auto-heal himself. That doesn't apply to status ailments. See what I'm saying? You make himself nauseous, he hurts himself, yada yada yada. If you manage to deal 650 in damage to him via nauseousness, then he'll go down, and only then. Once defeated, he'll have another dialogue. He'll tell you that Gygus managed to get the Manny Manny statue in the foreside, and it's going to ruin the city. It's essentially a, uh, you may have defeated me, but you'll stand no chance against the next guy speech. You'll do fine. Now, Belch appears to vaporize like all other enemies in the past, but he does appear later in the game in an advance not so distracted by honey form. So we haven't seen the last of Belch. Entering the dory behind him will lead to Milky Well, another sanctuary spot, and eventually back through to a new portion of Saturn Valley. You did it! You've defeated one of the highest ranking baddies so far, and hopefully have a jump on levels from the foppies. Before I go, I will leave you with a couple trivia. Belch's name is Anamanapio for burping, and his Japanese name, Gipu, Gapu, is also a Japanese Anamanapio for burping. The concept art for Master Belts shows him originally intending to have arms. Not very exciting trivia, but trivia nonetheless. One of the best parts of Earthbound is its randomness. We've talked about it before. Enemies that don't seem to make sense. Towns that make you suspend disbelief. Obscure social references, and so on. 
This week's boss is one of those random earthbound things. Not only are you still dripping sweat from the last battle, but it seemingly makes no sense. I don't even know how to describe the whole scenario, you know, but I'll try my best. You're about to fight a boss that can insta-kill you and has the highest HP of any foe you've come up against. Oh yeah, and it's dirt with eyeballs. It's Trillion Age Sprout. This boss fight is less than a two minute walk from Master Belch. Once you exit into the top level near the hot springs of Mr. Saturn's village, you can instantly enter into the domain of our next sanctuary boss, which seems like an odd thing, right? But then I made the connection while writing the script that I've never really pieced together before. If the bosses are guarding a sanctuary spot, then they are an exaggerated version of the creatures that are nearby. Now, I'm probably not the first one to notice this or piece it together, but it makes sense. You know, Gygus is making animals and people act weird and want to fight, and the sanctuary power is making them mutate. Now, I won't spoil forward things, but looking back, we have a titanic ant, which is a mutated black antoid. Mondo Mole is a mutated mole playing rough, and this one is a mutated tough mobile sprout. And the next five sanctuary bosses fit the bill as well. Like, it's, it's blowing my mind right now, and I don't know if people knew this already, but to me, it's brand new. So if you already knew this tidbit, do me a favor and comment. Team pays attention down below. And if you are having your mind blown with me, then comment Team New in Town so I know where we all stand. And back on track. I want to put a small note here. There's a meta cutscene that you can get from the Mr. Saturn who offers you a cup of coffee. You can drink it now or after the boss, though on this most recent run I drank it before the boss, I feel like it's more impactful if you drink it after the Trillion Age Sprout. So it'll be part of the next video, I'm not jumping over it. So under the nose of Master Belch, there's a powerhouse tucked away into a cave that seems to be creating its own minions. And I say that because one of my favorite named enemies only appears in this one spot. And it needs no introduction, because I'm sure we've all already giggled at it before. I am of course talking about the Ranboob. It's dumb looking to say the least and can really turn your team on their heads. But that name, Chef's Kiss. Since we are on topic of the enemies in that area, let's see what other enemies you'll encounter on this brief trip to Sanctuary 3. There are three predominant ones in this area. A Strutton Evil Mushroom, which are of course pains in the butt. Tough Mobile Sprout, which notoriously steal your PP and wreck strategies. And of course our buddies the Ranboob, which always seem to travel in groups of two or more. So you've exited the hot spring area and entered the cave to the north. If you're not careful, you'll be immediately ambushed by the enemies. They come hard, they come fast, and they can track you over larger distances than normal. If you are sucked into a battle, luckily, they seem to typically line up in the same row. So PSI fire is a great way to afflict damage across the board. Make your way through the cave and you'll spill into the valley leading to the boss cave. Again, the enemies are ruthless. You spawn them where you can, but take small steps. They like to ambush you from all sides. Focus on keeping your party alive. Let the battle go as long as it needs. If that means defending and healing, good. You don't want to have to repeat this area. At the end of the valley stretch, you'll enter the Chilean Age Sprouts Cave. I'm going on the record as saying this is my favorite of all the caves. The soil and surrounding walls give off this great feel of a lush environment. And the little water spots and mushrooms growing really adds the aesthetic. Right inside, you'll find a coin of slumber. Equip it to any of your players. It adds a whopping 30 defensive points. Continue on. I don't really think any enemies spawn in this cave, she should be good. Talk to the boss star thing and begin your battle with Trillion Age Sprout. Trillion Age Sprout is the guardian of the third, your sanctuary location, called the Milky Well. The Trillion Age Sprout is aided in battle by two tough mobile sprouts, which can heal the Trillion Age Sprout with life up. This boss is the first enemy encountered by Ness and his friends that can diamondize you, and is one of the very few enemies that can do so. Its name is a contraction of the phrase Trillion Age, in reference to its appearance, a withered sprout that has evidently survived for a relatively long span of time without maturing. The player's guide says this piece of trivia, which is one of my favorite and least favorite trivia I've ever heard. The Trillion Age Sprout is unlikely to be literal, as one trillion years is far older than the estimated age of the universe. So thanks for that bit of knowledge. So now let's talk battling. Trillion Age Sprout is immune to paralysis, so you cannot cut it off like Mondo Mole. It doesn't help that it's entirely likely to start this battle being mushroomized due to its high concentration of mushroom enemies throughout the dungeon. If all your party has a bad case of shrooms, it might be worth it to use your exit mouse and try to escape before losing the fight. Which, by the way, you can use Exit Mouse to leave a battle. Not sure if I've mentioned that before. If only one or two of your party is mushroomized, then it shouldn't be too difficult. Just avoid using powerful PSI or bottle rockets with that character. Overall, the battle isn't too difficult as long as you avoid being diamondized, which is up to luck, so good luck. Fire hits all enemies, so use it to take out the tough mobile sprouts while also dealing large damage to the Trillion Age Sprout. It is also a good idea to equip the Great or Travel Charms to avoid being paralyzed. Heal, heal, heal. Every boss can go off the rails, so keep your HP up. That's key. 
If you follow these steps, you'll have that 1000 HP boss dead in no time. And yes, it does take quite a while to get 1000 HP worth of damage, so be patient. Before we wrap up the video, I want to talk about one controversial thing the player's guide says. It says that the Trillion Age Sprout is the true boss of the zombies, stating that it's the source of all darkness in Threed. This technically isn't the case, as the route in Milky Way is optional, and the player can go to Threed after defeating Master Belch. That's right, this is the second sanctuary in a row that is an optional sanctuary that you don't have to do in sequence. Take all that in and remember that even the player's guide can be wrong. And there you have it, another boss gone with the wind. He may have aged for years and years, but all good things must come to an end. Do you know what else is coming to an end? Yep, this video. But we'll see you next Friday when we make our way through the desert, the big city, and a series of caves to battle a group of giant moles, the Guardian Diggers. The hard part is over. That's what an idiot would say because it's a false statement. In fact, the game is about to ramp up and not stop until the very, very end. We faced 11 bosses so far, spread out, and each tucked away in their own individual dungeon. But this time, we are looking at a hive of bosses, each equally as strong as the others. And not just that, but their environment contains unique beasts that were, up until recently, buried under tons and tons of dirt. I'm talking about the nuisance of the desert, the malicious mole men, the not-so-rat pack, the third strongest of the bunch, the Guardian Diggers. Unlike last episode, when we were a good two minute walk between baddies, this time we're a hike in halfway around the world. There's a lot of land to cover, so let's not waste time. After defeating the Trillion Age Sprout, and after checking out the third sanctuary, make sure to heal up and rest in the hotel. Say goodbye to Mr. Saturns and make your way back to Threed. As you pass through the Grapefruit Falls area, know that the enemies, like in Peace Forest Valley, are still hostile and will try to kill you. Avoid them at all costs. They still aren't worth fighting. Pass through the now abandoned catacombs and back up through the graveyard ladder. There you are greeted by nice people of Threed who will have finally left their homes and are excited to shake your hand. Take some time and explore the city there. There are a few houses to go inside and each NPC has some new dialogue. After you've had your fill of making new friends, head to the east facing bus stop. Pay your six bucks and take a ride. Shortly after you embark and enter the desert, you're greeted by the business end of a traffic jam. A seamlessly endless one. So you'll either exit the bus or turn yourself around and head back the way you came. Stop off and save and get supplies and then depart north through the hot desert. Now I don't want to linger on the desert because this is a boss video, but I will do a quick round of things to look out for. First and most important is to avoid the enemies by circling the outside of the map rather than walking straight through the middle. Along the outside track you'll find one of the game's most important items, a cup of life noodles. And on the path there you'll also find a couple of double burgers. Hold on to at least one of those. Second thing to look for is a contact lens which appears towards the northern part of the map. You can use this in a storyline a little bit later. The third thing to look for is the second most experience giving enemy in the game, the criminal caterpillar. They're a little green bug that moves quicker than normal and will always run away from you. Watch out for it and always pursue it. They have 30,000 experience points and will insta lose 9 out of 10 times. They don't spawn all that often but keep an eye out for sure. And the fourth thing you need to be aware of is Sunstroke. If you see the screen flashing red, make sure to heal Alpha once you notice so you don't lose track. It takes uh, 2 HP every flash. Now that's generally all you'll need for the desert. Of course there are more presents and people and a couple of single pixels you can talk to, but we'll leave that for another episode. Once you've made it to the far east side of the desert, head south and you'll find a cabin and an excavator before you get back to the road. Head inside and take a nap and regain your strength and save. Then head back outside. Talk to the fellow in the excavator. He'll ask for food, so give him one of those double burgers or something cheaper if you have it. Once you've fed him, you're free to head out of the desert and towards your first big city in the game, Forside. Forside is its own unique map, separate from every other place you'll see. For one, it's built on angles. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because the moon side later plays into that. Maybe because four side, four sides of a parallelogram. Who knows? Maybe it's just because the giant buildings are so big, it's the only way you can view them. Either way, it's cool looking. You'll have the department store, a business building called the Monotoli Building, yeah, he runs the town, a bar or cafe, a bakery, a hospital, a museum, and a theater. You will need each one of these buildings in this town at some point. First, head to the bakery in the southeast corner of the map. Heading to the second floor, talk to the man and give him the contact lens you found. He'll be so thankful on behalf of his grandmother and give you a pair of dirty socks. These are a one-time use offensive item that can freeze an enemy. That was a cool little side mission. After that, Head to the Topola Theater and buy a ticket to the show. Talk to the manager like in Tucson and she'll tell you that the Runaway Five are under her control. This time they are one million bucks in debt and must once again work until they are paid off. I have no idea how they've done this. They are literally the worst businessmen, good musicians mind you, but horrible with money. After you speak to the manager, head inside the main auditorium. 
cut across the way to the backstage room, catch up with your buddies, and leave again to watch their show. Once you've done that, head back to the desert shack where you fed the man earlier. When you return, you'll see that the ground is all dug up and there's a cave now presented. When you talk to the man, he'll tell you that there is a series of beasts that have filled the caves and it's our job to conquer it. Heal up and save before starting the section. Now I would like to announce something, if this is your first time through or maybe if you don't remember, and some warning. <laughs> if a party member dies in the cave, anywhere in the desert, you'll have to walk all the way back to Foreside. So preserve life as best as you can, take your time, because there's a lot of steps between those two things. Okay, now you've entered the domain of the Guardian Diggers, the trickiest dungeon in maybe the whole game. It's a maze, it's relentless, and it's packed full of poisonous enemies. Lucky for you, I have a map just made for you specifically to follow and help you get through the twisted paths in the best way. Once inside, head north all the way until you run into a ladder. You'll most likely see a poisonous snake or two. Heal from your poison as soon as possible if you're bitten. Take the ladder and you will encounter your first mole. This guardian digger is the third strongest mole in the bunch, so watch out. He is powered by a physical shield, so any physical attacks you send will be sent back at half strength, so be careful. The guardian digger can dash, claw, and tear into you each causing serious damage. They also have the ability to heal up to 120 HP, best to kill them quick. When fighting each mole, this needs to be the strategy. Ness will be your primary healer, though you may get lucky and get a smash that cancels out the mole's physical shield. You should defend or use offensive items if you have them. You can also use flash and it'll hurt the moles, but keep in mind that you may need to heal a lot during this dungeon run, so save your PP. Jeff is similar to Ness. If you have offensive items, use them, but mainly defend and stay below the radar. Paula will be your main powerhouse in these caves, so keep her alive. It will take two rounds of freeze beta to kill the moles, so plan on that being your way to defeat each one. Defend or heal, freeze beta, defend or heal, for two rounds. Then collect your prizes from the guardians and continue on to the next stop. Once you finish your first mole, continue west, climbing the ladder. Follow the path all the way down until it loops back up and you will find the fork in the road. Take a left where you reach the heart of the cave, where the exit mice reside. Say hello to them. Then take the bottom path until it ends and there you will encounter your second mole. This Guardian Digger is the third strongest mole in the bunch, so watch out. He is powered by a physical shield, so any physical attacks you send will be sent back at half strength, so be careful. The Guardian Digger can dash, claw, and tear into you, each causing serious damage. They also have the ability to heal up to 120 HP, best to kill him quick. Once you leave your second mole, double back the way you came and go back to the heart of the cave. Say hello to the mice once again, then head up until you dead end into your third mole encounter. This Guardian Digger is the third strongest mole in the bunch, so watch out. He is powered by a physical shield, so any physical attacks you send will be sent back at half strength, so be careful. The Guardian Digger can dash, claw, and tear into you, each causing serious damage. They also have the ability to heal up to 120 HP, best to kill them quick. Once you leave your third mole, double back to the heart of the cave, greet the exit mice, and head to the left and go down. After a short walk, you will arrive at your fourth mole encounter. This Guardian Digger is the third strongest mole in the bunch, so watch out. He is powered by a physical shield, so any physical attacks you send will be sent back at half strength, so be careful. The Guardian Digger can dash, claw, and tear into you, each causing serious damage. They also have the ability to heal up to 120 HP. Best to kill him quick. After your battle, head back to the direction you came, but keep going north past the heart of the cave. The path will dead end at a ladder. Take it and follow that path until the end, where you will find your fifth and final mole. This Guardian Digger is the third strongest mole in the bunch, so watch out. He is powered by a physical shield, so any physical attacks you send will be sent back at half strength. The Guardian Digger can dash, claw, and tear into you, each causing serious damage. They also have the once you defeated the final mole, the music will change and you'll hear the Dusty Dunes theme. Feel free to wander through the cave freely now and collect the remaining items. There are a few nice ones scattered about. Uh, this might be the only dungeon that doesn't have any enemies after the bosses are defeated. Please say goodbye to the exit mice on the way out, especially if you've used one of their sons to navigate the way out. And there you go. You'll make a best friend and a cave digger guy, and you're on your way to freeing the Runaway 5 yet again. Now on your way back to the city, you'll be stopped by the excavator operator who will give you a diamond they found but we'll cover that part in the next episode. And looking at my sheet, it seems to be no other than a very odd little creature, the department store spook. See you then. Hey friends, welcome back. Hope you're all well rested after that gauntlet last week. That sure was a lot of moles to pass tense. And come to think about it, the only purpose of the fight was to save the Runaway Five. At this point, it's really a fairly one-sided relationship. That'll change eventually, so don't worry. This round, we have one of our first strategy shifting bosses. Normally we can fall back on Paula's PSI abilities, but this time our boss has other plans. She may have been swooped away in the dark, but don't sweat it, her dudes are going to save her. And we have our eyes set firm on this week's boss, the department store spook. Last time we were left in the middle of the desert, empty handed and exhausted. But start your trip back to Foresight and your hard work will pay off. Once you're about halfway across the bridge, you'll be stopped by George, who will give you a diamond for your troubles. Everyone calls the mine a gold mine, but clearly it's been mislabeled. Take that diamond back to the foreside and without hesitation, march right up to the theater manager. Get nice and close and present her with the unimaginably valuable diamond, and she will consider it as payment and tear up the band's contract. 
Head back to the theater and watch one more performance of The Runaway Five. This time they have a guest act, Venus, who helps bid them farewell. After the show, you're good to move on to your next dungeon, though you won't think it is at first glance. Unlike the first time you arrived at Foresight, the department store is now open again, and it's the most jam-packed store we've seen. It consists of four levels and pretty much any item you'll need. Here's a quick rundown of what to buy. And note that before your shopping spree, it's a good idea to call Escargo Express to take any unnecessary items out of your inventory. If you plan to buy everything you quote-unquote need, I suggest taking out about 10 grand from the ATM. The woman at the counter on the main floor sells show tickets to the Venus shows. You can also get them at the front counter of the top left Topola Theater, so don't sweat it here. Moving to the second floor, you'll find a burger shop, food shop, food cart, and an arms dealer. If you want to grab some protein shakes or picnic lunches as an alternative to lifing up, go for it. But most importantly, visit the arms dealer in the far room and make sure to stock Jeff up with big bottle rockets. I'd say four or five if you can carry them. These are pivotal against the next boss process. Traveling to the third floor, you'll find the shop and tool stores. At the tool shop, you're going to drop a good amount of coin. If you want to save your money, don't buy anything for Paula. Like I briefly mentioned earlier, she won't be around for a while, so no use to waste your money if you don't have it. Get everyone gold bracelets and equip Paula with a chef's frying pan, if you got the funds. Head to the top floor. On the fourth floor, you'll have toys and sports shop. Equip everyone with a coin of defense and tie Paula's hair up with a defense ribbon. Again, only if you have spare funds. I also avoid the yo-yos in this game. They always seem to miss when I need them the most. But if it works for you, I don't want to discourage you. I just don't think the extra firepower is really worth it. Now your shopping is all done. You can check out the boss's office if you'd like and get a view of the battlefield. Just don't forget to sit in his chair. You get one pass through the department store, so make sure you've made all your purchases before heading back down. Make sure you give either Ness or Jeff Franklin badge if you don't have it already. Once you reach the ground floor and walk past the first tree, the lights will suddenly cut out and a blur will steal our sweet, sweet Paula. A message comes over the speakers that you have to get back to the fourth floor if you ever want to see your friend again. So starts phase one of getting her back. Please don't go in all gung-ho. Some of the toughest enemy in the entire game reside in this department store. They hit hard, and they are everywhere. You'll find the Musica, which is the guitar thing, and has nearly 300 hit points, and loves to use Thunder Beta. This is where the Franklin Badge will come in handy. Next are the Mystical Records. They're a pain because they can heal each other. And the final enemy that you'll see is a scalding cup of coffee. It spills hot coffee on you and takes effect on all the party members, so they suck. If you get into the battle with more than one enemy, utilize a big bottle rocket. The last thing you need is to lose a teammate and have to go outside to heal, because your trip to the boss will be even farther. Enemies appear in little packages and are fast, but they move in straight lines, so there's a ways of evading them. It does take some skill and luck, but it's a good way to avoid some battles. Another bummer you'll face are the escalators. Unlike doors, you don't have the option to quickly despawn enemies. You're at the mercy of whatever is spawned on the way up. Utilize their travel paths at this point, or accept your fate. Upon reaching the fourth floor and successfully reaching the boss room, you've done all the heavy lifting. That is, if you still have a couple big bottle rockets. Confidently walk right up to the department store spook, and make sure to talk to him from the side so you can see this ridiculous profile, and you're ready to meet your foe. The department store spook. The department store spook was sent to ally Mr. Montatoli from Gygus himself. They can clearly see that Paula is the one true threat to the universe, so it's a good strategy to take her. In the department store spook's pre-battle monologue, it nearly states that Ness and Jeff will burn in hell, but instead goes on to say that they'll go to heaven. It's a funny little writing thing. He has 610 hit points and an oodle of PP. His entire moveset are PSI moves. His most common attack is Freeze Alpha, but it, he also knows Fire Alpha, Life Up Alpha, Brain Shock Alpha, and Magnet Omega. He is a hard hitter, but will fall quickly if you use two big bottle rockets on him. Ness can choose to use his highest level rockin' or save his PP for healing. Luckily, he fights alone, but he can life up himself, so be aware of that, and he might undo some of your hard work. Make sure you keep your health above 100 hit points as best as you can. With a little patience and a couple rockets, he will go down. Once he's defeated, he reveals that Paul is being held in the Montatoli building, confident that his master Gygus will avenge his death. His death turns the lights back on in the department store, and the party can go buy items once again. And there you have it, another boss bossed by the best. Your little team of guys are just starting their bonding experience, but you'll have plenty of time to get to know each other, because very soon we are slipping between mental dimensions and fighting a really heavy hitter, an idol of the ages, a real powerhouse. I'm talking the Manny Manny statue. See you next week. Hello, fellow Earthbound fans. Thank you for your patience over the long extended holiday break. I am back and more ready than ever to create more content for you. It was hard for me to remember where I left off. Time and age, I'll do that to you. But when I saw those two repeating words that have given me nightmares since I was a child, I snapped right back. The golden idol that ideally would be as far from me as possible. This boss has so much lore to it that I've made an entire video dedicated specifically to it. Now I'm talking about this shiny son of a gun, the manipulative middle man, the statue that 
that'll come at you. I can feel myself getting corrupted just saying its name, and I'm talking about the Manny Manny statue. Now, before we get into the boss, let's first make our way through the motions of how to find him, or rather, how he finds us. Last time, we defeated the department store Mook that kidnapped Paula, but we still didn't rescue her yet, so our hunt continues around the town. If you head to the southwest corner of Foreside, you'll come to the cafe, head inside, talk around, and then leave. There, you'll find a crowd of people that has formed, and in the middle of the crowd, there's a familiar face. It's our boy Everdread, and he's not in good shape. He has been presumably attacked by Monotoli's men and left to die outside on the ground. Now, Monotoli may be the villain of this town, but it turns out that his mind has been tainted by the evil Manny Manny statue that we saw back in Happy Happy Village. When you talk to Everdread, he explains what brought him to this place in time. He states that when we last saw him, he caught wind of the statue and stole it from the car painter. He then brought it to Foresight to sell to the top bidder, but Monotoli stole it right from underneath his nose and left him for dead. I mentioned earlier that I made a whole video dedicated to the Manny Manny statue. I would suggest pausing this video and watching the other one first before finishing that one. I don't want to keep retreading ground too, but I don't want you to miss out on anything. The video is just about 14 minutes if you're interested, and don't forget to leave a comment stating that this video brought you there. Okay, you back? Good. Now the Manny Manny statue is in the hands of the city's rich villain and our ally is in the gutter. Every judge staggers off after filling you in the backstory and also a way to slip between dimensions. He says to check behind the counter at Jackie's cafe. When you do, you are transported to Moonside. Now it seems like a physical place that has buildings and roads and people that you interact with, but in fact it is just a psychic illusion created by the Manny Manny statue. But more on that in a minute. Jackie's cafe in the entire city actually seems to be now outlined in this neon glow, and it appears to be like uh, nighttime. Speak to the woman at the cafe and she'll tell you that it's opposite day, and yes means no, and no means yes. This is important to remember. Before we get into finding the Manny Manny statue, let's talk enemies. As one would assume, there are some cutthroat baddies the statue has manifested. You have the abstract art, they use weak bashing attacks, but can also use hypnosis alpha. Also, there's Dolly's Clock. This enemy has a unique ability to freeze targets in time, dealing moderate to high repeated damage to any of your party. Next, we have the Enraged Plug, which uses a standard bash attack and sprays gigantic blasts of water, which uses the same functions as PK Fire. Also, Robo Pump has a high offense and defense and will spend the first few turns counting down to a bomb toss, which deals a moderate to high explosive damage. It can also replenish a fuel supply, which uh, works like a life up gamma. Robo Pump wastes turns, saying tick tock. When defeated, it occasionally drops a super bomb, so look out for those. Feel free to fight all or any enemies to level up, but don't obsess over it. Wandering about town, feel free to talk to the people, but especially be aware of the blonde haired, Hawaiian shirted men. They will teleport you to different places around the map. Some take you to fun presents, some take you in circles, and some take you to key plot destinations. The man in the first corner that's south of the cafe will take you to a man dressed like a sailor who is guarding the pathway to the Manny Manny statue. He says you aren't a man with a unit brow and a gold tooth, so you cannot pass. Note him and move on for now. While exploring the town, look for a teleporter guy on the steps of the hospital. He'll send you to a present with a knight pendant in it. It's very valuable and you'll need that soon. Eventually you will end up at a man with glasses and a black suit. He'll be the outlier that teleports you to the most necessary of spots. The room you end up in is a bit trippy. Not like the rest of the place it isn't trippy or anything. The floor has an odd pattern and there is presumably one man in this room. After a dialogue, and once your eyes adjust to the room, you'll notice a shadow person looming about. Talk to him. Make sure to swap no for yes, of course. Once you talk to him, talk again to the man that's visible wearing white, and you'll be teleported out of the room. The shadow man has stuck with you and will follow indefinitely. Your goal now is to retrace your steps and find the sailor man that refused to let you to the Manny Manny statue before. Get there as quick as you can, because the invisible man can get quite annoying very fast. You can either teleport your way down, or follow the road outside the hotel south as far as you can go. When you find the man, speak to him, and he and the invisible fellow will leave together to hang out and get a drink. I think it's adorable. Take the last few steps toward the Manny Manny and speak to the illusion of Monotoli and begin your battle. The Manny Manny statue, or evil Manny Manor, is a primitive golden statue of humanoid figure that brings out the evil in human beings, which is used as a focal point to spread Gygus' influence across the world. The statue enhances people's desires for fame and fortune, hence the name's similarity to the word money and the resemblance to an Oscar award. Alternatively, the Manny in its name may be taken from the word manipulate. The best strategy is to have Ness equip the Knight Pendant. We've recently picked that up. To avoid any PSI flash moves. Then have Ness use PSI Rocket and have Jeff use Bottle Rockets. 
evil Manny Manny should go down in a few turns. However, if you do not have any bottle rackets, it will be an annoying battle. Keep using physical attacks until Nestor Jeff is paralyzed, then you should start using PSI Rocket. This is more effective, as once you are paralyzed, you cannot move anymore, and you can only use special moves. Also, the evil Manny Manny has the ability to cancel all PSI moves during the battle, so that's tricky tricky. Take your time with this battle, it can get out of hand if you don't think a turn or two ahead. Keep your HP up so you don't get overwhelmed. Now I actually got oddly lucky this first run. At first I defeated him with two turns worth of big bottle rockets, but I felt it was too easy. So then I went back to his safe state and ran the battle again. This time I used Flash. Manny Manny got confused and ended up emitting a glorious light, which is a one-hit death, so he killed himself. So though it's random and it's pretty cool. After the battle, it is confirmed that Moonside is an illusion the whole time, and you are actually wandering around a storage in the back of Jackie's Cafe with a faraway look in your eyes. Before I let you go, I want to give you some trivia. The pencil eraser can be used on the Manny Manny statue outside of the battle to produce a unique text. It says, do you really think this looks like a pencil? You know, nothing happens, but you can st it still reacts to it, you know. Manny, or Mani, I'm not sure how it is, is a Norse god of the moon, which may be where the Moonside comes from. And it should be noted that Pokemon shows up wherever the Manny Manny statue goes. Onet, Happy Happy Village, Foreside, and if you count Ness's Nightmare, Magicamp. Hinting at his connection through the game. In Mother 2, which is the Japanese uh, port of Earthbound, the evil Manny Manny's name was more along the lines of Manny Manny Devil or Manny Manny Demon. However, Nintendo of America's division changed it to Evil Manny Manny in order to avoid any religious references. That's somewhat ironic, given its appearance as a gold, bullheaded idol, which is uh, not particularly subtle. Biblical reference, anyway. And there you have it. One of the best bosses in the game, not necessarily the most difficult, but one that is definitely has some incredible backstory to it. And I hope you enjoyed the experience. What are your thoughts on Moonside? Have you any theories of why the Manny Smanny statue would create a unibrow gold tooth man as a way of escaping? Is that some kind of bug in the system? Who knows? I think Moonside as a whole could use a lot of dissecting, but that's a video for a different time. For now, I will leave you to ponder. Next week, we will dip and dodge around the clumsy robot. See you then. Hello, and welcome to another week of Earthbound Bosses. Last week, we dove into the mind of the evil Manny Manny statue and came out dazed and confused. This week, we are moving away from the giga intelligent to the downright dumb and stepping one step further into the weirdness that makes Earthbound so beloved. The boss this week is just doing its job. It's simply existing in a place that we should not be. It may be built as hired help, but it'll be helpless at the end of things. I'm talking about the old clumsy robot. Fresh out of the last fight, we are still bewildered inside the cafe. Go ahead and head outside, and you'll be bombarded with what can only be described as the game trying to segue into many potholes all at once. First, a monkey appears and will slam into the side of the cafe. When you talk to him, he'll say that he can teach you teleportation. That's awesome. Random, but awesome. And he'll zip away. Then immediately, a finely dressed man in thick glasses will show up and say he's a member of your sister's delivery company, Escargo Express, but a subsidiary group, the neglected class. He is quite bad at his job and accidentally left a machine that creates trout-flavored yogurt in the desert. He then makes it quite clear that it's your job to retrieve your own item, and then he leaves. The third person to show up is a maid who works for Monitoli. She's been looking for a trout-flavored yogurt to serve to their new guests, you know, like, like you do. And she wants you to find her when you find it. Then she takes off. At this point, we are very, very confused, but we know one thing. We need to head back to the desert and investigate. Either jump on a bus or hoof it. It really doesn't matter. Once you're all the way back to the general store, go ahead and save. Now we can start one of my least favorite parts of the game, but the more I play it through, the more I appreciate its randomness. Now I recently put a poll up on my channel of whether or not I should detail these monkey caves, which reminds me, keep an eye open, I might use future polls more often. But a good majority of you wanted me to go into detail on how to get through the monkey caves rather than skip them, so here goes. Before you start, you will need three very important things. First, sell any unnecessary items or use Escargo Express to remove anything you don't need. Second, on the subject of Escargo Express, make sure you have the pencil eraser in your inventory. You will need that. Third and final thing, you'll need to buy a picnic lunch and a skip sandwich at the general store before leaving. All good? All right, here we go. Talk to the monkey and head into the caves. You're going to need this map as a reference. I'm going to try my best to break the path down, but since we just go back and forth, uh, there might be a bit of a scramble to make it coherent. Just some housekeeping rules before we do start. The opening choice is what we determine our paths. The picnic lunch path will be coded in blue, and the skip sandwich path will be coded in red. Now if you get lost, just keep heading through the right door in each room until it brings you back to the first corridor, which will appear longer than the rest of them. And if you'd like the monkey to stop walking freely through the room and snap next to this door, 
simply leave the room and immediately come back and he'll be stuck in place. Okay, that's pretty much all the housekeeping. Are we ready to dive in? Let's go. First, enter the skip sandwich side of the tunnel and grab the wet towel. Then head back to the main room, take the picnic lunch path, grab the pizza, continue to choice two, use the wet towel on the right and the pizza on the left, continue to the left to get the pizza, then turn back around before continuing. In that room, take the right door, which was the wet towel door, grab the hamburger and the ruler, and continue to the following room. Give the first monkey the hamburger and retrieve your fire pendant, our first prize. Now this is the optional end to the blue path, believe it or not, we're there already. I'll come back to this path at the end for bonus goods, but if you don't want to get those extra bonus goods, disregard. Now travel back to the start. At the main path now, take the blue door, traveling through the portion you've already grabbed the wet towel from and into the next choice. Give the pizza to the left monkey and go through the door. There you'll find a protein drink. Grab it and backtrack to the previous choice room. Now give the protein drink to the right monkey and that will take you to a corridor with a hamburger inside. Continue to the last room on this branch. Give the ruler to the left monkey, head into that tunnel and get the king banana. Back out of the king banana room, back through the choice room, back through the empty hamburger room, and into the following choice room. At this time, you are going to want to take the left side, travel through the protein drink room, and to your last new choice room. Give the king banana to the monkey on the right, and just go into the cave after. Grab the two presents, which are a hamburger and a picnic lunch. Now, hopefully I have not lost you at this point. Hopefully the map kind of coincided with what I was saying. If you'd like to continue through the end of the cave, please skip to this part of the video. If you'd like to gain a couple other useful items, which are the neutralizer, which cancel out shields and other attributes, or also a, either a bag of Dragonite or a broken tube, which becomes an HP sucker, which is pretty useful, then keep watching. Back up one room so that you are in the room where the monkey is still asking for a hamburger in the left door. If you want to get the bag of Dragonite, then give the monkey your hamburger. If you want the eventual HP sucker, then exit the path until you get all the way back to the red-blue split with me take the left door cave hallway right door cave hallway give your hamburger to the left monkey to receive your broken tube then backtrack through the long room with a choice through the next cave hallway and into the following choice room you've already given both monkeys an item so take the left side continue through the cave hallway and then stop before you talk to that monkey. You are about to grab a fresh egg from that monkey. For those unfamiliar, the fresh egg has a sort of a short fuse before it hatches, and once it does, it's useless to us now. This is a bit of a journey back, especially if you haven't done it in this order, but the path is clear now, so you'll have plenty of time to reap the rewards, but still don't dawdle. Grab the egg from the monkey. From here, backtrack all the way to the start of where the red-blue path split. Then, navigate the following choice rooms. First right, which is a skip sandwich path, then right, and then you'll end up at the fresh monkey egg. So those are the two choices. First right, then another right. Choice room, choice room. It seems easier on paper. If you have iron nerves, then you won't have any issues. Once you're in the next room, enjoy Jeff's awesome weapon and breathe easy. It's all downhill from here. Backtrack two choice rooms and then take the left side and then right side. Follow that path until the end of the line. Here you will finally use the pencil eraser which will lead you into one of the best rooms in the game, the silent meditation room. Talk to the shaman, and when he's done, grab your presence and make your way back to the surface. Congrats, you've done the monkey cave, and I hope that I did it justice. I apologize if it was too confusing. Once you're through the caves, you're ready to learn teleportation. Head to the road with monkey, learn it, and then teleport to winners, grab Nest the T-Rex bat. You can also grab the coin of slumbers if you'd like, but I think I'll wait on those personally. Then teleport to Foresight, so we can finally get to our boss. Make your way to the Monotoli building and department store intersections. There you'll find the maid that wants the trout flavored yogurt. Once you talk to her, she'll snatch the yogurt and dash off inside. Follow her. Take the elevator all the way to the top of the tower, further past your last limited point. There you will find some beefed up security. The span of hallways and rooms ahead of you are pretty out of the ordinary, at least for this business complex. The main hallway is a dark space that has a couple bathrooms that are inaccessible and two sets of doors. The rooms past those are classroom style rooms. Not sure what's going on in those rooms. But what I do know is that each one is occupied by a killer death robot. The game calls them Sentry Robots, but it's all the same to me. While fighting the Sentry Robots, use PSI Rockin' if there are more than one. Otherwise, just use standard attacks. Keep your HP above 100 to stay as safe as you can. The odds of you avoiding the Sentry Robots is fairly low, so embrace the battles and strategize your healing. 
The best way through the classrooms is from the dark hallway, take the third door, then head up to the top middle, then straight across, then into the right door, then the top door to get the trout yogurt before leaving that door and choosing the left door, which will bring you finally to our boss, the clumsy robot. Unlike other robots that appear in Montola building, all of which appear to be built for combat, the clumsy robot behaves less like a sentry and more like a malfunctioning janitor. Despite its erratic behavior and strange appearance, the clumsy robot cannot be defeated by conventional means. During Ness and Jeff's battle, it attacks infrequently, spending most of its time turn-wasting, doing things like cleaning the area, reeling, and wanting to go and get a battery. However, when it does attack, it launches a missile that deals approximately 300 points of damage. One of its attacks is eating a bologna sandwich, which claims to restore its HP, although it really does nothing. It may also stumble and fire a strange beam, which may cause solidification. Keep your HP above 120, and you should be okay. He starts with a PSI shield, so be sure to have Jeff use the neutralizer if you plan on using PSI rocket. Otherwise, just use your normal attacks. You can also use a rust promoter on him because he's a robot type. When the clumsy robot is defeated, the Runaway 5 bursts in and flip the off switch on the back of the robot, causing it to stop moving. A big requirement you must do before taking on the clumsy robot is getting the Runaway 5 out of debt from the top of the theater. However, if you were to find a way out of the requirement, with Paula still in the party, fight and defeat it. Instead of the event where Lucky flips the off switch, Black Smokes envelops the room, somehow escorting you out of the Montatoli building. This could also mean things were very different during development. I thought it was kind of cool. And there you have it, down with the clumsy robot. What do you think is the hardest part of the segment? The trip leading up to the boss or the boss itself? Personally, having to read through the countdown from 10 each time the sentry robot starts a fight. That's my choice. Next episode, we'll find out what's behind that door ahead and what stands ahead for the fate of our friends. We're also going to hoof it back to winners for a big old baddie in another sanctuary spot. See you then for Shroom! Hello and welcome back, Earthbound fans. I'm your host, Ben Sleva, for another video breaking down the bosses of Earthbound. Last time, we left on a cliffhanger after we fought our way through the inner workings of the Montoli building. Thankfully, the Runaway 5 finally came through and turned off the killer robot that was attacking us. This time, we will learn what is past the door ahead and we'll go zipping around the world searching for this week's boss. We all know the one that makes us feel a bit strange, the guy who has way too many O's in his name, a name that you can't say without yelling because it's noted that way. I'm talking about Shroom! Like I said a moment ago, we are face pressed against a door with an eager attitude to see what's beyond it. After you talk to the Runaway 5 buddies, which is some nice dialogue, go ahead and head through. It's there you'll find the big man of the city, the guy who's behind the Manny Manny statue issues, the theft of Paula, and the corruption in the area. But as soon as you come face to face with him, he cowers and runs away. Talking to him reveals that he was nothing more than a pawn in the game. He's nothing but an old man that has been manipulated by evil. He reiterates that the Manny Manny statue is evil and its powers were frightening. He says the statue told him to stop Ness and to not let him travel to Summers and to avoid the pyramid. Some of it is cryptic for now, but he says that Summers is across the ocean and the fastest way is to take his helicopter to get there. You head down the corridor to the helipad, but it's there you find your old buddy Porky. He's taking advantage of the situation and he's hitting the road before the other shoe drops. Unfortunately, he's taking the helicopter, and you'll need to find other means of getting to Summers. It'll be a roundabout way, but you have to know of a spaceship not too far away. Head back down the Montatoli building, down to the bottom floor. Waiting for you is your best pals in the whole world, the Runaway 5. Climb on the bus, and they'll take you all the way back to Three. Luckily for you, some of your friends happen to be super geniuses, and they have fixed the Skyrunner. Pedal back to the cemetery where Jeff crash-landed and talk to your friends. Jeff will finish fixing the ship, and you're on your way back to Winners. Enjoy a bathroom break while the characters fly through the sky. Several minutes later, you'll land gracefully in Dr. Andonis' lab, talk to some monkeys, and then head outside into the cold. Now, there isn't much distance to cover between the next boss, but there is a nice little grind spot if you're looking to put in some work. The reason it is nice is that it's right next to the lab, which is a free and instant recovery robot. So grind to your heart's content, or don't. It's up to you. If you do feel like a fight, you're going into two enemy types. The first is Cave Boy. You've seen him before. He's a bit stronger in his attacks now. Though his HP stats didn't change, he hits harder. Use regular attacks to kill him, or use Paul's freeze attacks. You can't go wrong there. The other enemy is Mighty Bear 7. Not sure why he's named that, but it's an upgrade version of the Mighty Bear we saw in the Happy Happy Caves. The same as Cave Boy, use physical attacks, or Paul's freeze, for a quick, experience boost. Once you've grinded as much as you'd like, head into the cave ahead, and go straight across. 
you're about to grab your fourth sanctuary boss. Shroom is the guardian of your fourth your sanctuary location, the Rainy Circle. It is capable of mushroomizing its enemies, similar to other mushroom enemies in the game. It is first encountered by Jeff while he's en route to Dr. and Donut's lab in order to rescue Paul and Ness, but he cannot go forth into the battle because it's Ness's sanctuary. Shroom does not have many damaging attacks, so it mostly relies on causing status conditions. The battle itself is relatively easy as long as a player is lucky enough not to suffer too much from the effects of the inevitable mushroomization. You're gonna get mushroomized, trust me. There's no way around it. If a character has been shroom to try to avoid using power attacks like rock and or big bottle rockets, shroom can be defeated instantly by flash, but since beta is the highest form you'll have, it's unlikely that the death effect will happen. It'll be tempting to use fire while Paul is mushroomized due to that being its weakness, but it is so risky because if it hits your party, it hits all of them. Shroom shouldn't be too difficult to beat without it. The Earthbound Player's Guide states that Shroom is accompanied by the rambling evil mushroom in battle. However, in the actual boss fight in game, he fights alone. This is either a miss in the game or the player's guide being misleading. Once Shroom is defeated, Ness and his friends may enter the rainy circle and record the fourth piece of the melody of the soundstone. So this is going to probably end up a pretty short episode, especially compared to the last couple. But I'm okay with that. Did you know that each second of video takes two to three weeks of knuckle-busting editing? I won't have to soak my fingers in brine this week, so hooray! Instead, I will leave you some homework. Of the four sanctuary bosses we fought, that's Titanic Ant, Mondo Mole, Trillion Age Sprout, and Shroom, which is your favorite and why? Leave your answers down in the comments, and I look forward to reading them. Next week, we'll encounter another sanctuary boss, and it's nice to get them back to back. But this one is nothing to mess with, and I guarantee it'll be a longer video. I'm speaking, of course, of the Rat of Doom. Welcome, my good friends, to another episode of The Bosses of Earthbound. I am your host, Ben Sleva, and I have a great show in store for you this week. Last time we met, we did a bit of backtracking and end up in Winters again, where we revisited a cave near Stonehenge. There we bullied a giant mushroom and learned more about the memories deep in our mind. This week, we are going to scout another sanctuary spot by backtracking yet again, but not before completing a couple of out-of-the-ordinary tasks. Buckle in while we walk our way through the world and head towards the rodent that won't hit the road, the pest that's far from the best, and the bottom feeder that'll end up a retreater. <coughs> I'm talking about a baddie with a heck of a title, the Plague Rat of Doom. When we were done fighting Shroom, we were still in winners. So head south and back to Dr. Andonis' lab and talk to Daddy one more time. He'll let you know that the Skyrunner is good to go and it'll take you to Summers. He's not lying. Heal with your robot buddy and climb inside the Skyhopper. After a shorter than last time trip through the sky, you'll arrive in Summers, where you'll crash land and never get to use the Skyrunner again. We have teleportation, so that's okay. There are some enemies in Summers, but do your best to avoid them. They're the Crazy Sign and Mad Taxi that we saw in Foreside. Mole Playing Rough that is rare, but is the same tiny enemy from a while back. Then you'll find the Overzealous Cop and the Tough Guy which give a good amount of experience points, but still, in my opinion, are not worth fighting. Once you've shaken off the stress of the trip, go ahead and explore the town. Everything there is overpriced, so don't sweat not buying anything. From left to right, you'll find the hotel. From here on in, if you need a hotel and you're not in a tight location, teleport to Onet. It's the cheapest, and you'll land right outside of it. Next, there is a restaurant, which of course is pricey, but fun to look through and talk to the NPCs. Next is the shop. No need to stop here, it's overpriced. Next is the Stoic Club, which you'll come back to in a couple minutes. For now, you have no way of getting in. And your last two buildings are the museum and the hospital. The hospital is self-explanatory, and the museum is a good walk around to talk to the NPCs and get a feel of some plot points to come. But when you're done visiting the hoity-toity part of town, continue to the next section in the east. There you will find boats in the harbor and a bunch of smaller homes. This is called Toto. Feel free to walk around in all the houses and talk to the NPCs inside. One person, I like to refer to as the Rastafarian man, will give you the phone number to the Stoic Club. This is very important. Finally, when you exit the shop, Tony, Jeff's old friend, will call you and ask for your name. Yes, you, the player. Give it to him and then hang up after he awkwardly talks to you. From there, head to the Toto shop and make a reservation at the Stoic Club. Then go to the club. Once inside, talk to everyone. They are quite entertaining. Now, this entire city just keeps making fun of rich people, and I love it. You're pointed to the woman at the door, and when you talk to her, she says you can meet her outside. How about that? And she will sell you some magic cake. Right near the beach outside, you'll find her and her buggy. Talk to her and she'll give you a slice of magic cake. And you'll trip balls. Good old kids game, huh? 
During your time of enlightenment, you'll have visions about a boy in a far off land. This is the fourth and final member of your team, Pooh. Now different from your journey to get Paula where you fought lots and lots of monsters, and when you were Jeff and you had to travel far distances and fight lots and lots of monsters, Pooh's home of Delam is more peaceful, and you won't have to fight a single enemy. You will have to give up your limbs, sense of mind, and uh, other things, <laughs> but we'll get to that in a minute. After you wake up as Pooh on his throne, you'll leave the palace and venture towards town. Grab the presents in people's houses and talk to any NPCs. You'll discover that you are about to finish your Moo training, and that's a good thing. At the end of the line at the edge of town, you're greeted by a trainer who will briefly talk to you and then fly away. Climb up the ropes all the way to the tippy tippy top of the tower. A person will appear and tell you to go back to the palace because it's not time for training. Ignore them. Then, a creepy ghost head will float down from the sky. This next bit of dialogue gets quite heavy and will test every bit of your will. Your job as a player is to make sure that you always say that you will never give up. They'll take your arms, your legs, your ears, your eyes, and eventually your mind, and all the way along, just say that everything's fine, and before you know it, you'll have completed your training. I may have just quickly dusted over that, but just the implication of what's happening is enough to make an entire video about it. So, as you play through it, take the time to enjoy what's going on. Once the training is done, head all the way back to the palace and talk to your father. He'll teach you a few useful tricks, including teleportation, alpha, and beta, and then send you on your way. You'll arrive on the beaches of Summers and join the team. The prophecy has come together. Now, for the good chunk of the sanctuary spots, you can do them in any order, and this one is no different. You can choose to go to Scaraba. Scaraba? Scaraba. I think I would call it Scaraba. You can choose to go to Scaraba first if you want, but I suggest heading back to Foresight because Pooh's level will give you some problems with the heavy hitters in Scaraba. Head back to Foresight. Head inside the museum, pay your fee, and then head all the way to the west wall and talk to the curator. He'll tell you that he'll do anything for an autograph of the new biddy playing at the Topola Theater. You happen to have an in with management at the theater, so head over for a not-so-quick show. After a performance that seems to last half an hour, head backstage and get your autograph from Venus, which happens to be on the peel of a banana. Take the banana peel to the curator of the museum, and you are now ready to enter the fifth Sanctuary Bosses dungeon, finally! This place is on my top five worst dungeons in the game. It's long, it's a weird linear maze, and all the enemies are tough and can give you some lasting ailments. You'll encounter the Deadly Mouse, which is a counterpart from the Titanic Ant Cave with a ruthless smash attack. Filthy Attack Roach, who is tough but can be beaten by a bunch of offensive PSI attacks. And the Stinky Ghost, whom is a pain in the butt because he will probably possess you with a tiny ghost, which will disrupt the entire rest of your sewer journey. I got a tiny ghost in the first battle and he stayed with me the entire way. If you have to fight them, make sure you keep your party alive. Use PSI moves to keep their battle short. Like all dungeons, there is a butterfly room at the end, so you'll have plenty chance to get your BP back up. The trickiest part of this dungeon is getting the map right. If you have to backtrack, you'll end up in battles. And there are a few places you're able to despawn enemies, especially because you go so slowly. Take this path. Once down from the surface, head to the right into that room, grab the broken iron, which becomes a slime generator. You'll notice this game smartly puts only broken items in the sewer, so if you have the life force and the willpower, Jeff will end up with three more broken items he can fix later. Leave that room and back up to the little ladder to the left of the service ladder. No need to go in the room to the left, it's, it, there's a croissant there and a garbage can in the sewers. Ew. So climb into the water and head to the east. Ignore the urge to go off the second ladder and backpedal the door. It's only a broken spray can, and you should have fixed one already. It becomes a defense spray. If you don't have it, get it now. If you'd avoided that door, then you will be in the water until the far, far end of the second full screen. Got with me? Get out and double back halfway through the screen to the door. This is the butterfly room that you can get in and out multiple times to replenish your PP. Leave your butterfly palace and follow the dry path through the far right tunnel entrance and into the door by the two orange barrels. Despawn if you can and grab that last good item. It is a broken bazooka, which becomes the heavy bazooka at IQ level 45. To finish off the dungeon, plop back in the water and get to the last ladder in the series. Hopefully you won't find an enemy here. Now I kinda zipped through the dungeon, but you are more likely to find a slew of enemies and this it might take you a half hour plus to get through this. Anyway, let's start the battle. The Plague Rat of Doom is the guardian of your fifth, your sanctuary location. This boss is not terribly difficult, though like other rat enemies in Earthbound, the Plague Rat of Doom's gut stat is maxed out to 250, which means it has a high frequency of smash, making it extremely likely to land critical hits and its bites are occasionally poisonous. It is recommended that you use paralysis on it so that it can't attack in the first place. Use PSI Rockin', PSI Fire, and Bottle Rackets if you have them. Don't let your HP drop below 100, and make sure you keep your crew free of ailments that you can heal away. 
Now that you have two healers in your party, take advantage of keeping everyone happy and healthy. Let Ness bash and watch for major healing, have Polly's fire and freeze, have Jeff shoot rockets or bash, and then Pooh can feel free to heal or bash. Hopefully he's gained at least five levels since you've started the sewers. It may take a long time, but it's not horribly tricky of a battle. When defeated, the gang will finally visit Magnet Hill as well as acquire the Carrot Key. Now we will find out what the Carrot Key does next episode when we will fight the sixth Sanctuary boss and third one in a row. That Sanctuary has my favorite part of the Sound Zone recording and our first glimpse at a truly otherworldly boss. We'll learn more about them later, but for now I'll just leave you with a name. Thunder and Storm. Hello friendos, welcome to another episode of the Bosses of Earthbound. My name is Ben Sleva and I will be your host today. And every day, really. Last time I left you, we were all stinky from swimming in the sewers, all covered in rat guts. This time we are traveling to far reaches of the earth to combat a unique enemy. Our new guy Pooh is going to show us around his hometown for a little clash of meteorological danger. I'm talking about Earthbound's equivalent to Ying and Yang, the twins that hopes to wins, the sanctuary guarding brothers that intend to smother us. I'm having a lazy pun week, so let's just get into it. I'm talking about Thunder and Storm. Now, some of you may think that this sequence that I'm fighting bosses is a bit out of whack. A lot of times before I record these videos, I watch a few different playthroughs, separate from my own, to see how others progress through each boss. And I was met with an overwhelming amount of people that don't fight these bosses until after Scaraba. Heck, even when we look at the boss stats breakdown, you can see that though they're listed in the ways the videos line up, the HP level, experience points, and money hint that it should be fought in a different order. So if you are on your own and happen to see different enemies, don't feel like you're doing it wrong. Just know that the magic of Earthbound gives us many ways to play the same game. So you've killed a Plague Rat of Doom and collected the Rabbit Key. If you choose to follow my path, then jet off to Delam and get ready for a few photo ops. You'll catch one outside of the palace and one inside as well if you happen to go there to heal. Walk through town to the southwest corner. On your way, stop at this shop and pick up a bunch of brain food lunches. They are a lightsaber. You'll frequent this place through the rest of the game because brain food lunches are the greatest recovery item. Make your way to the cave, use a carrot key, and head inside. Now this dungeon has to be one of my favorites. I'm a big fan of the boss, I'm a big fan of the music. The layout is pretty nice to the player, and like I mentioned at the end of the last episode, I am a big fan of this week's sanctuary music. So all around, I have a good attitude going in. Before I cover the path, let's talk about the unworldly enemies that you'll run into. There's the Conducting Menace. The Franklin Badge is your friend in this battle. Take him out with a few offensive PSI attacks. Next we have the Kiss of Death, and after starring in a toothpaste commercial, it's turned to a life of crime. When it couldn't find any work, look out for its poison. There's Tangu. Harmony of the Flutes makes you drowsy. Be sure to bash the wind out of him. And wait until after he's defeated before you start your healing. I need poisons. And there's Thundermite. It might be an easy win. It might not. It depends on who has the Franklin badge to reflect its bolts, and make sure Paula has that badge on. On your first couple run-throughs, this map seems quite intimidating. There seems to be a lot of paths, there are holes in the ground that seem to be a maze, and you'll run into a dead end or two. It's easy to get discouraged. But when you look at the map, you'll know how easy it all is. First, you'll need to take a little detour for looking for the boss. From the outside door, head straight across, go through that door, climb down the super long rope, and you'll end up finding the Bracer of Kings, one of four of Pooh's equipable items. It is a necessary thing to have, it is significantly increases the advantage Pooh has in the future battles. Now backtrack all the way to the beginning. If you need to heal now, this is the time to do it. Leave the cave, head back to the palace. If you're ready to fight the boss, then climb that rope inside the front door and follow the path until it ends, taking that hole. You'll land on the ground with three choices. Though my brain has tricked me into thinking that this dungeon is littered with choice rooms, this is the only place that requires a gamble. Avoid the first two holes and jump down the last one. This will lead you to a smaller room with a rock candy. Grab that item. It is the most important optional item in the game. If you've seen my video talking about the rock candy glitch, you know. If not, I'll link the description for you to check out. In a nutshell, you can manipulate each player's stats by using a rock candy and assault packets, and you can do it a billion times, and trust me, it's, it's worth checking out. Check out that video. Jump down the rock candy hole and continue to the end of the line to start your boss fight. That's the whole dungeon, boys and girls. Thunder and Storm are your sixth sanctuary boss in Earthbound, and guard your sanctuary pink cloud. While they are technically two entities, Thunder and Storm fight as one and share a single HP pool and moveset. They tend to take deep breaths before using their devastating interwind attack, so Ness and his friends will have a fair warning. Now speaking of attacks, they can bash, use a crashing boom bang, hopefully thwarted by the Franklin badge, summon a storm, which is a flash attack, blinding your party, and finally they set up and execute their interwind move, 
which deals extremely high damage to one party member. Use PSI Rockin', Freeze or Fire, and Bottle Rockets if you have them to take them down. Remember to keep your party healed and use some braid food lunches to keep your HP and PP up because it can get you up to 50 PP recovered, and that's like four moves guaranteed. If you persist enough, you'll win the battle and you'll be one step closer to that ultimate mental power. Head outside, take in the view, it is beautiful. And before we get into the trivia and outro, I'm gonna leave you with the Soundstone song so far. It hits so very nice. Ah, it's simply amazing. I'm glad we're writing that song together. Before I leave, here are some trivia. Storm holds a large palm leaf, which in Japanese mythologies is often used by magical creatures as a way to cause storms. Next, their appearances seemingly hearken to the latter half of the phrase ox-headed demon and snake-bodied deities, which often refers to the imagery of being surrounded by evil beings and entities of all sorts. And finally, they are only one of two sanctuary guardians that do not play the sanctuary guardian track. They are their own people. There you go. Thanks for watching my video. Much love all around. And speaking of love, I would love to announce that the channel has finally reached 3,000 subscribers. It's such a good feeling to know that I can bring my videos to so many people. Truly humbling. And thank you all that subscribe. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. My name is Ben Sleva, and I will be your host. Last week we fought Thunder and Storm, a whirlwind of a pair that gave us a run for our money. This time we are jumping immediately into another boss, one that attacks us when we are our most vulnerable. I'm talking about the sea beast that's far from the least, that it turns in the form of a serpent, a mythological monster that's no average lobster. He's big, he's bad, he's the Kraken. Now, if you haven't noticed by the runtime of this video, it's gonna be a short one. There's no dungeons to get through and really no resistance between leaving Delam and being attacked. It's just leaving Pink Cloud Cave, teleporting to Summers, and then finding your total boat captain. Bada boom, bada bing. And since time is money, and we all have stuff to do, let's just get right into our boss. The Kraken is a boss first encountered by Ness and friends while traveling on the ship to Scaraba from Toto. It resembles a large green snake with red hair and orange and red fire breath. His theme is shared with Thunder and Storm and Electro Spectre, who we haven't seen yet. Before you disembark, it is hinted that you'll find Kraken, but never guaranteed. In fact, the first time I was playing through, I was sure that we'd skip right past it for some reason. But nevertheless, towards the end of your journey, the sky will get dark and the wretched beast will strike. Have Ness use PSI Rockin' for the first round, then save his PP for healing and just bash from then on. Have Paula use Freeze or Super Bombs if you have them, and Jeff can either use Big Bottle Rockets or Bash if he doesn't have any. As for Pooh, use Freeze, or do what I did and have him mirror the Kraken. It isn't hugely affected in reality, but it sure is an eagle bruise for Pooh to know that he has the ability to possess the traits of a Kraken. You should still have the Franklin Badge equipped for assistance, and uh, Don the Flame Pendant for protection if you have it. The Kraken's moveset includes Fire Breath, which is a generic PSI fire attack for affecting everybody up to 300 points of damage. Emit a pale green light, which cancels all PSI effects. Crashing Boom, which is another generic PSI thunder, which can do up to 180, up to two random party members. PSI Flash, which 60% chance of crying, 10% chance of strangeness, 15% chance of paralysis, and 15% chance of instant death. And he can generate a tornado, which deals high level damage to all party members. He is a reasonably difficult enemy, so take your time and think a move or two ahead. There are three Krakens that appear later in the Sea of Eden area of Magicant. These Krakens appear as enemies, but the boss encounter fanfare and the boss world are still used, and they will not reappear if defeated. The Earthbound's player guys has a mistake in it, saying that the regular Kraken can drop the Gutsy Bat, when in reality it's the Bionic Kraken, found in the Cave of the Past, much, much later, that can. The Kraken Soup description says it's made from the fin of a Kraken, you can buy it in Summers, and since it recovers all of Ness, Paul, and Jeff's HP individually, it makes it one of the best healing items in the game, and it's only 648 bucks. In Seafaring Legend, a Kraken is a mythological giant octopus or squid that can drag entire ships to the bottom of the ocean. The visual design of Kraken in Earthbound appears to be more sea serpent than octopus or squid. The endeavor ends with the captain saying, Oh man, I thought you were just little kids, but you defeated the Kraken. I also helped in the battle. I threw my slipper at the beast. Maybe you didn't notice which is a great little additive. I like the picture of this guy doing his part. 
joining only Picky and Bubble Monkey so far as short-term allies. And there you have it. Finish your voyage to the northern shore and enjoy the desert air in your face. We'll have a big journey ahead of us, but for now, let's just be happy that we survived the trip across the sea. You'll never have to worry about it again. Now, I'm not sure the editing schedule for next week, but I can tell you who the next boss will be. The Guardian General. Hello everyone. Sorry I missed last week, but I was editing my way through some vacation videos. You see, we took a trip to the Florida Everglades. You should check them out. I'll use this as a good segue actually to advertise some other content I produce here on YouTube. It's my travel vlog. There's dozens of video dedicated to our travels and I think you'd like it. If you enjoy traveling the world of Earthbound, you'll enjoy traveling our world with me. Uh, anyway, back to the content you're here for. Last time we left, our crew had just stepped foot off the boat to Scaraba. We defeated the Kraken in the waters and now we're ready to perfect our tan as we get historical in this hot desert. Ahead of us awaits an ancient warrior, a brave stone-forged beast that packs a wallop. He's more rock than Dwayne Johnson, he's harder than the pyramid he lives in, and he's more stoned than stone. Our next boss may be royalty in some way, and I'm talking about the Guardian General. Since we fought your way here, you might as well enjoy the town for a little bit. There are plenty of shops to check out and a hotel that will heal all your wounds. It's also there that you'll find an arms dealer. Make sure you stock up on all your big bottle rockets you can hold. You won't spend all much time here in town, really, but it is a great part of the game to take advantage of the rock candy glitch. If you aren't familiar with the glitch, it is when you pair a seasoning with a rock candy item to upgrade your stats limitlessly. I go into great detail on how to complete the glitch in another video. I highly suggest doing it at some point, especially if you want to leg up on the later part of the game. It is essentially like grinding 2.0, and it'll change the way you play the game. You can literally push your HP past 999 substantially. It does take some time investment, but it pays off. Check out the video I've linked to get the full rundown. Trust me, you will not regret it. Now, while you're in the area from the bottom of the town to the top of the pyramid, keep an eye out for a little red bug shimmying around. You met his brother back in the Dusty Dunes Desert, and this guy is even more generous with his experience points. Most times, you'll get a green swirl and instant win from him since he's running away. And if you have a full party, he will give each of you 20,600 experience points. That's a lot for those keeping track. They don't spawn all that much, but a good 10 minutes spent looking will get you a couple of them and will make the whole process worth it. Once you're done dancing around the desert, head to the lower right corner of the map and follow the text guidance in front of the pyramid. Trace a star starting at the top of the dots and the pyramid will open. Inside you will follow a collection of paths that will lead you through the pyramid and all about underground. You will find a slew of enemies inside, so let's be ready for those we'll see. There's the arachnid, who's weak to fire, freeze, paralysis, brain shock. It's an insect enemy, so you could use insecticide spray if you have it. Fierce shattered man, who's weak to freezing and paralysis. The guardian hieroglyphic, who's weak to fire and sleep. The lethal asp hieroglyphic, which is weak to freeze, paralysis, and sleep. And the petrified royal guard, who looks kind of familiar, and he's weak to fire and paralysis. The enemies inside the pyramid are fairly dangerous. If you encounter too many enemies in one room, back out and come back in for fewer enemies to fight. The Shattered Man and Petrified Guards are the most difficult, so be careful when fighting them. The hieroglyphic enemies on the wall are always there until they are defeated. No matter how often you use the disappearing enemy trick, those ones will always stay on the wall. The map is fairly easy to follow. You'll climb up, up, up until you reach the center room, where the puzzle is in the middle, and then you go down, down, down until you reach the boss. The only skew off is in the puzzle room where you can take the left door that climbs up another set of stairs to get a bag of Dragonite. Collect that for an extra offensive bump. Feel free to despawn enemies with the doors since it's quite a hike back to the beginning of the dungeon and back to any hotel or hospital. After a trek that seems way too long and dangerous, you will find the boss of this episode, the Guardian General. The Guardian General is a boss who commands all the hieroglyphics in the Pyramid of Scaraba. He's made entirely of bricks, and as a result, his defensive power is very high. He lacks guts and speed, but his offensive power is good. He is responsible for guarding the Hawkeye. His moveset includes bash, come out swinging, and charge forward, which all deal low to high level of damage to one party member. He can also shriek a war cry, which lowers one party's defense and defense for the duration of battle, and he can make something spin around, which drains your PP. His battle music is the track used for Sanctuary Guardians, the reason possibly being that he guards a crucial item needed in the later part of the game. He uses a physical attack, so shield is effective. The Guardian General has high defense but relatively low HP, so it shouldn't be too difficult. You can use bottle rockets and bombs if you feel like it, however, physical attacks aren't very effective here. Have Paul use Freeze PSI to do a good amount of damage. Use Live PSI whenever needed. Use Mummy Wraps and Vipers you've obtained earlier to poison to disable Guardian General. And have Ness do a PSI life up. After a short brawl, you should come out as a victor. 
and you can complete the second half of the pyramid. But be careful, there is still danger ahead. And there you go, another boss battle down, and one more step closer to the game's end. Seriously, there are eight bosses left that I will cover over the span of six videos, so it's getting down to the wire. I am really enjoying making these videos, but it's nice to see we're making progress. Founders, my name is Ben Sliva. Yes, the W sounds like a V. It's because I'm Polish. Today, I'm skipping the pleasantries because we have so much ground to cover before our next boss. We're fresh off the heels of the Guardian General, a massive brick man. But this time around, we are in search of the exact opposite material that a creature can be made of. And I'm talking about our old friend Stinky, the gloopy glob that slithered away to hide in the darkness. Like gas station sushi, it starts as belch and ends up as barf. If you haven't guessed it by now, I'm talking about our old pal, Master Barf. And yes, the opposite of brick is Barf. Duh. Last time I left you in the middle of a pyramid, scared and confused. The button inside the room following the Guardian General activated the drop hole in the center of the pyramid. So head back to that spot and jump down. It's here you'll find the Hawkeye, a marvelous piece of equipment that'll help you see in our next destination. Follow the remaining path of the pyramid until you reach the other side. There's still a bit of a hike and several enemies blocking your path, so stay sharp. Once you leave the back exit of the pyramid, Pooh's trainer will appear and whisk him away. So make sure you take any items away from Pooh that you may need. The two zip away all heroically, and you are left to your own thoughts and your other two allies. If you have money on you, stop in the north and buy some supplies from the merchant with the camel. Circle the water puddle and talk to the native there. He will give you a key to the tower. From there, head northwest to meet the hands-down, undisputed best character in the entire game, Dungeon Man. I'll save my fanboying for another video, but he fights like a champ when you use him, he hides away amazing real life easter eggs, and he's an all around dude. Again, we have so much ground to cover that I don't want to swoon too long over one place. Inside you'll be greeted by the dungeon man's, well, dungeon. To the left you'll find a doctor's office to help with dead allies, a bench will help you heal your party with a good rest, and a telephone and an ATM for your outer world's needs. Get all healed and get ready for a bit of walking. The good thing to note is there aren't really tricky enemies inside. They consist of present enemies from your past, and the trickiest ones being the ones you encountered in the department store earlier. They have the same power level as they did back in Foresight, so it shouldn't be that big of a problem. Our pal Dungeon Man consists of four levels. There are a couple presents worth diverging from that path that I'll cover, but I won't be visiting them all. Also, one of the best parts of Dungeon Man is the little placards that are lined about. Read as many as you can, they are all worth it. From the main fork, head right, take the first incline, follow it to the left until it ends for a couple of life noodles. Backtrack to the base of the incline and continue to the left as far as possible, skipping the second incline path, unless you want to get a super plush bear at the end. It's completely up to you. Keep at the path until you reach the rope wall. Choose the third rope from the left, the rest are just dead ends. From the proper rope, known as hole C, follow the path, hugging the right wall all the way until the dead ends at the bottom of the screen. Follow it to the left, and up at the first chance, you'll see a rope ladder. Take it. Straight ahead, you'll see another rope ladder. Take that. But before you do, collect the two presents you can see on the way. The closer one will be a sudden guts pill, and the second is a PSI caramel. After the second rope ladder through the ceiling, hug the wall and take the only rope in that room. That will take you to the quote quote end of the dungeon. You'll meet Brick Road himself, and he's just a charmer. After your chat, go to the first tool you see and follow all the preceding ones until you reach the main fork again. From here, save and then head out to the front door. You now have a giant dungeon man attacking for your party. Feel free to engage a few battles in the meantime. Wander about the countryside as long as you'd like, but end up at the bottom of the map between these two trees. It's there that the dungeon man will get stuck and accept that he will live there for the rest of time. The path continues a bit where you'll find a native that will hint that you need a submarine. Returning to the dungeon man, he will explain that he has a submarine and that you need not worry anymore. He welcomes you to find it, and you get to do the dungeon all over again, you lucky son of... Seriously, uh, if you want to rewind to the part of the video that helps you get back to the face wall where Brickman is, rewind. If not, then uh, test your fate by going through on your own. Once you talk to our buddy again, he'll open up a second exit hole. Lulz. You should now take. Follow the series of holes until you end up at this platform. Now follow the path, grabbing the talisman ribbon on the way and continuing to the end of the line among a pile of old vehicles and machines in the corner. Check the submarine and it will prompt Jeff in fixing it. You're now in a cutscene inside the submarine, heading out of Scaraba towards the destination of our boss. Don't worry, we still have a hike to reach him, but make sure you salute Dungeon Man as you drift away. Once back on terra firma, 
you'll find a weird looking bird. That's your phone for saving and calling Escargo Express if you need them. Head to the right and up to the green grass. This is your downtown area. You can find a doctor, a hotel, an arms dealer, and a general store. If you need an ATM, you'll travel south a bit until you find an air pipe bobbing in the water. Stock up as needed and talk to the area people. Once you've upgraded, rested, and purchased some multi-bottle rockets, you're ready to head into the deep darkness. Travel until you reach the blacked out place. Once you're surrounded by dark, use the Hawkeye and you'll be able to see fully. Now, I've spent a good amount of time outlining directions through maps and whatnot. Deep darkness is no exception, but it is as easy as this. Find the right wall or a group of what appears to be mangrove trees. Here's a side note. I just came back from uh, riding in an airboat from the Everglades with my family a couple weeks ago, and I've never connected this place looking exactly like trails we went there. Let me sh I'll show you a video. This is what it looks like. Doesn't it look like deep darkness? I've never made that connection. Anyway, find the right side and trace it all the way until the boss. Here's a little example of what that means. It'll trim off some accidental traveling and running into enemies since you move pretty slow now. There are a slew of enemies that you'll find in this area. An absolute slew. Let's get an enemy roll call. We have a big pile of puke. Try not to breathe near this vomitrocious being. Its status altering ailments add difficulty to the battle. Next we have the demonic petunia. This plant proves that the little shop of horrors orders its fauna from the deep darkness. Next is an even slimier little pile. Looks like someone tried to eat too much eggplant. It'll make you cry and call for help, so watch it. Next, a hard crocodile. This hard-hitting reptile has a soft size. A lucky victory will yield a super plush bear. Next is an hostile elder oak. Some old folks are just mean. Save him for last because, he guessed it, he explodes. Following him is the manly fish. He's not really that manly. He just keeps poking at you with his spear. He should be no trouble. And Manly Fish's brother, the aquatic foe, has the power to bring back the dead. And you can too, with the rare horn of life he drops. Pit Bull Slug to follow up. They're the pits. They like to travel in packs, but they're so easy. This just means free experience. And finally, we have the Zap Eel. Shockingly enough, it attacks with bolts of lightning, but the Franklin Badge can help you get a one-up on that. That's been the, that's been the, uh, the enemy segment. <clears throat> Along the way, you'll find a couple of life noodles and a rock candy, which can be used to speed up the rock candy glitch now that you will have two of them, or possibly three, maybe. After the last rock candy, you're only mere feet from this video's boss. Of all things to find in all places throughout the game, this is the first one that makes the most sense. It's just a slimy blob of barf squished between a narrow passage of scummy water. Grab your two friends' hands and march proudly up to Master Barf and get ready to mop him up once and for all. The Master of Regurgitation has returned for a second battle. Master Belch has more hit points, so he'll be tougher than ever, says the player's guide. He starts off by saying these actual lines, Drown to death in puke. Followed by, Don't you think that was an incredibly masculine taunt to throw at you? Um, so, uh, that's a crazy way to start a fight, in my opinion. Master Barf is an upgraded version of Master Belch. Master Barf is now immune to fly honey and can even call little slimy piles to help. His moveset includes burp and blow, nauseating breath, which targets one person. He can also start a continuous attack, which also attacks one person. He can exhale a blast of stinky breath, which makes everybody cry. He can, like I said, call for help, which can summon even slimier little piles. There you go. Use your standard attacks until you start crying. Once you start crying, you can use PSI Rockin', PSI Fire, and whatever bottle rockets or bazookas you have. Wait until after the battle to heal nausea, and keep your HP above 110 if possible. After he suffers enough damage, Pooh returns from his training with the Star Master, and kills Barf with his newly learned PSI Starstorm ability. I like to picture that this move makes Barf explode so amazingly that it obliterates him forever. He won't be able to run away this time, mostly because he's just specks of matter. Master Barf also drops the Casey Bat, always, which is the most powerful bat, but only has a 75% chance or less hit rate, so I never tend to use it. And there you have it, another glorious boss down. Finish your trek through the last little bit of swamp and enjoy the rest of your day resting in a cave. It's very quiet, I've heard. Next time we'll face up against the King of Starmen, and maybe we'll get lucky on the way, wink wink. I'll see you there when we talk about the incredible Starman Deluxe. Hello Earthbound peeps, my name is Ben Sleva and I will be the one walking you through this week's episode. Last time we covered a very, very, very long portion of the game. From Pyramid to Dungeon to Dark Swamp. This time we are going from fighting the primitive to out of the world future tech. The metal man ahead is no tin man. He's not looking for a heart because he has no need for one. 
The 80s called. They want their shoulder pads back. You knew his junior, and you're about to meet his deluxe. We all know who I'm talking about, so why am I stalling? Let's strap on our big boy pants and get ready for Starman Deluxe. Last week, we finished our trek through the swamp, defeating our old nemesis Belch Barf once and for all. This time, we prop up on dry land, shake off our boots, and head into a cave filled with friends that we will get to know a bit better shortly. Talking to everyone will show that they are too shy to speak, so like any awkward situation we're part of, we leave. Upon exiting the city, we receive a phone call. It's Apple Kid, your buddy. He's developed a new machine called the Eraser Razor, much like the Pencil Razor. But while on the phone, you hear a commotion, and he is stolen, and the call cuts off. Almost immediately, the phone rings again, and it's Orange Kid. He's trying to unboil an egg, and just kind of slips into the convo that the Apple Kid has headed to Winters to work with Doctor and Donuts. Since we are the heroes, after all, we head to Winters to track down our missing friend. But first, and this is very important, teleport to the start of Deep Darkness, and grab at least one multi-bottle rocket that you'll save until the boss. Trust me. Stop at the general store for supplies. You should have uh, weapon upgrades already, so don't worry about them. And grab some coins of silence for your party if you have the scratch. Once you're done buying and talking, leave the store and get ready for a hike. You know the layout from back when we were Jeff, and that knowledge is going to be tested now. The landscape hasn't changed, but there are some horrible baddies that block your path. They include the Lesser Mook, the Whirling Robo, and the Woolly Shambler. They're all disguised as diamond sprites in the overworld, so you don't know what you get until you see them. That'll be a common theme for the rest of the game. Feel free to grind if you want, though. You'll want to be between level 50 or 60 by the boss's dungeon, so plan accordingly. At the bottom of the first segment, you'll go through the same motions as earlier. Stand at the Nessie port and wait for the big old beast to stop by. He'll take the entire party to the southern shore on his head and then say goodbye for the rest of the game. But it's nice to know that he's still there, though. The Ying to the Kraken's Yang, which no longer exists. Walk your way back through the Brick Road's first dungeon and think of all the good times you've been through. At the bottom end, continue to the Rainy Caves dungeon that'll lead you straight to the Stonehenge, and ultimately you'll make your way into Dr. and Donut's lab. It is there that you can talk to a mouse, and he'll give you the Eraser Eraser. Save your game. You're entering the second hardest dungeon in the game. The hardest being the end game. Welcome to Stonehenge Base. The 40-mile-long cavern has four spots. The Purple Squid Maze, the Sword of Kings Factory, the Strobe Light Corridors, and the Boss Room. None give you any breaks, and as far as I know, there isn't any butterfly room, so... Your best bet is to avoid all enemies that you can. If the ones you end up fighting are too tricky for you, then grind a bit in the front of the cave and frequently go back to Dr. Andonin's lab for a refresh. Don't push yourself, because you'll need all the strength at boss time. Speaking of enemies, let's cover those. You'll notice how similar they are to the bunch we just fought, and you can tell you're getting closer to the epicenter of Gygus' baddies because of the evolution. You have the automatic power robot. It'll take some time to drain the life of this mechanical beast because it keeps replenishing its HP. Military Octobot. He may only have four extremities, but you don't want to call him a Tetrabot. That just sounds weird. Mook Sr., this old tentacle foe, has some nasty PSI attacks and can diamondize you with his evil glare. Starman. No ranks yet, but he still beams you up. Easy there, Scotty. And the Starman Super. It can revive fallen party members, so rough it up first and hope for the elusive Sword of Kings. We'll detail that in a little bit. Use your Eraser Eraser to get inside the actual dungeon and follow this path. Straight through the first room, and in the second room, head down through the bottom door. Then directly across to the right, and to that far door you won't be able to see it first. Then head down, and follow that around until the staircase. Take that door, and the next room, follow the path to the right, diverging at the first big square, only to get the Kepa Life Noodles. If you ever needed that item, it's now. Then finish out this part of the map and get ready to make a very important life choice. If you choose the red pill, continue to use caution and make your way through the factory base. If you choose the blue pill, accept your fate of being trapped forever in the Stonehenge base because you're going to forever be looking for the Sword of Kings. Red pill people, skip to this timestamp. Blue pill people, skip to this timestamp. What are you going to choose? Hmm, what are you going to choose? Hmm. Looks like you've chosen the blue pill. Looks like you have all free time in the world. Good to know. I'll send you my laundry to do since you're so bored. In taking the blue pill, you'll have fully signed onto hanging out in this section for many, many hours. Freely walk around each path collecting the presents you want. No rush, though. Take your time. Have some fun seeing the sights. While you're enjoying yourself, look for these golden boys. These are the Starman Super. They're a bit unique because they have a chance of dropping Pooh's only weapon in the game, the Sword of Kings. But it's not as easy as that. 
the chances of them dropping is 1 in 128, meaning that there is a 0.78% chance they will drop it. Each battle has that chance. It's not a summed up total. Meaning 100 fights later, the odds don't change. It doesn't mean that if you fight 128 Starman Supers, then you'll get the sword eventually. No, it means that each battle has less than a 1% chance of finding it. That's what makes it so tedious. If you've heard anything about this Sword of the Kings, that's what people are talking about. If you do not get the Sword of Kings before beating this dungeon, you will never have a chance to get it again. There are no ways to cut corners either, and the entire process is up to luck and the fate of the Earthbound Gods. So, here's another chance to choose this puppy. Ah, you've chosen the red pill. You must not have much spare time. Maybe you're a parent. Maybe you're just not a masochist. Uh, whatever the reason, in this first room, head to the far right before taking the ladder down to grab that broken harmonica. It will eventually become the baddest beam, which is a great weapon for Jeff. Double back to the door and follow that ladder down, continuing to the end of the room, avoiding any enemies as you can, because they are some heavy hitters. The next room you come to is the exit mouse room. Grab a buddy and keep moving. The final enemy ridden room is the strobe area. There are a few presents to keep an eye out for and one to avoid. Through the door, take the path to the left. Don't continue straight, it's a broken trumpet, it makes a defense shower, but if you have the defense spray, you're good to go. Follow that path to the top, and when it forks, take the top for the speed capsule, then the bottom for the pixie bracelet for Paula, then the middle for the boss room. This room will lead you to an eerie sight. You'll find a good amount of friends trapped in glass containers. They have been kidnapped by the Starmen because of their mental abilities, and are either going to be used in experiments, or to manipulate them, or to kill? I don't know. Either way, you have some saving to do. In the next room, you'll find the big man on campus and the boss of this episode, Star Man Deluxe. You are much stronger than our intelligence indicated. We are not prepared for that eventuality. The prophecy from the Apple of Enlightenment may be true, but you must not underestimate us. That's Star Man. That's my Star Man Deluxe. Do you like it? Of course you did. Get ready for quite a fight. He's as heavy a hitter as he looks. According to the Earthbound Player's Guide, it is a prototype that took so long to build that only one could be made. The Starman Deluxe enters the battle with an automatic PSI shield beta, rendering any psychic attack on him useless, unless Jeff uses the neutralizer or the shield killer. So if you have those, use them. During the battle, it can fire a beam, as well as put up PSI shield B. The Starman Deluxe is notable for being the first enemy in the game capable of using PSI Starstorm which is in only the alpha version, but still. It is also has the ability to call for help and have a Starman or Starman Super join the battle. But the defeat of the Starman Deluxe automatically results in the defeat of all other Starman and Starman Supers that join the battle. Once it's defeated, all of the henchmen retreat the Stonehenge base and are never seen again. The first thing to do is use PSI Shield Omega to counter Starman Deluxe's PSI Sandstorm. If Jeff has any of these multi-bottle rockets that I told you to bring, use them to end the battle quickly. It should take one. One rocket should take him out on the first turn. If you don't have any rockets, use physical attacks to take him out. Make sure to keep your shield up if it goes away. If you didn't save any bottle rocks for him, you just keep bashing. Make sure to keep your uh, HP up as high as you can. Starstorm is a pain. And just like that, the base is empty of its robotic inhabitants, and you are good to talk to your newly saved friends. Another boss down and another step closer to the end game. Doggone, you're making me so proud. The real highlight of this run is the Sword of King, so I want to hear all of your stories. What pill did you choose, and were you able to get that sword? I have played through this game so many times that I've lost count, and I have never, ever, 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 ever gotten the sword. So keep that in mind if you're struggling to find it. It's very defeating, <laughs> so don't sweat it, man. Anyone out there find on their first couple or even their first fight? I won't believe you if you say you did but it'll be nice to hear. And like that, we're done. Keep an eye open for next week's boss, the odd uh, twist of metal that'll scramble your mind. The Electro Spectre. Hello, you crazy kids. I am Ben Sleva, and I'll be your host for the show this week. And I promise, yeah, I won't bite. Last time, we did a great deal of walking around and a greater deal of stressing over whether we'd find the Sword of Kings or die in a heap at the bottom of an endless chasm at Stonehenge Base. Luckily, we survived to tell the tale, but this week, we have a shorter episode because we're only worrying about a library and a pit in the ground. But it's what's in that pit that will give us some incredible nightmares. And I'm talking about the twisted metal that doesn't include Sweet Tooth, a bunch of rubble that'll make us fumble over ourselves, a sharp, jagged dude that may be tossed into a cycle bin because he's being too dang used. I'm talking, of course, about the Electro Spectre. Now that we've rescued the smartest minds in the game, it's our job to let them work on inventing the future of tech. We'll give them some space by backtracking all the way back to Onet. It's there we'll visit the library and find us a book to gift our new tend of friends. This book is all about overcoming shyness, a book that we could all use at one point in our lives. I read it when I was 27. 
Some read it when they're three. Regardless, it's our duty to get it. Head to the stack of shelves and tinker around for a bit. After no time at all, you'll find it and be ready to go back to Tender Village. Before you do, though, make sure you equip the Franklin badge to Paula and check that Jeff has the neutralizer in his inventory. March directly to the head boss and throw the book at him. He'll teach his fellow Tendas some social skills. If you dance around the table and talk to that fella, you'll be offered another cup of tea, and it'll be our time once again to reflect on our journey. I'm not really sure what this tea officially represents, but if I know anything about time travel and whatnot, part of me thinks it's Ness from another timeline, maybe helping the true hero get that little bit of motivation they need to keep going. Maybe it's just because I'm a dreamer. Who knows? After the words of encouragement, you can begin to explore more Tenda Village. Around this corner, you'll find a rock talking to a nearby Tenda. He'll lift up the rock and reveal a rope ladder. Take it down and enter this week's boss dungeon. Stop. Before you go any further, I need to backtrack and refer to the third episode in this entire series. It was there that I mentioned that there were three mandatory grind spots in the game. The first was that Titanic Ant Cave. The second was at Master Barf's Fortress, where we fought the Foppies. Now is a third and final grind spot, the Fobby Slaughter Ground. You see, much like their counterparts, the Fobbies come in great hordes and go down like a bag of bricks. Take your time to fight them because they'll lead to some higher levels. But you know what? I got a bit ahead of myself, and for that, I'm embarrassed. Let's go back up a little bit and go over all the enemies you'll find in this dungeon. We have Conducting Spirits. Show him the sparks that fly when you smash him into tomorrow with physical attacks. Fobbies, like Foppy. This creature is not much of a problem and offers some nice experience boost. Hyper Spinning Robos. These metallic beings can keep you from using PSI skills. Smash it to bits. And Uncontrollable Spheres. A real troublemaker, sporting both PSI fire techniques and a deadly self-destruct sequence. Finish him last. <laughs> Bobbies are mostly at the entrance area of the dungeon, so get to grinding out in the beginning to ensure the rest of the dungeon goes well. And since I've said Dungeon 81 times now, let's discuss the ins and outs of it. Even with this map, this dungeon can get tricky. There are a lot of ups and downs, so grab my hand and I will guide you. Once through the entrance, hug the left wall and take that first ladder, Ladder A. There is a rock you were told to speak to and also a super bomb that will come in handy later. Backtrack to Ladder A and again head to the surface. Hang to the left, skip that hole in the floor and take Ladder B. That will lead you to a cave. Then if you follow that ladder, you'll take C after grabbing an IQ capsule. Ladder C will take you to a dead end, but the dead end produces the Diadem of Kings, which is the third of four of Pooh's only equipable items, so you'll want to get that. Backtrack Ladder C and grab Ladder B. I know it's a lot of ground to cover, especially with all these enemies around, but that earlier Fobby battles will pay off. Once back at the top level, backtrack a bit and follow it up this time all the way around the loop to Ladder D. Ladder D will lead to a sub-level, which you need to follow all the way until it ends. You'll get a rock candy and a bottle of DX water. At the very end is Ladder F. Ladder F will come back to the top surface and to our boss. Skip the ladder in between, but don't talk to the boss until you walk all the way to the end and get the rabbit's foot. It is a great equip. Say goodbye to the Fobbies and say hello to this week's boss, the Electro Spectre. The Electro Spectre is our seventh year sanctuary guardian. The guidebook states that it's made from an unknown material not of this earth. According to Nintendo Power, the Electro Spectre is said to be comprised of the leftover remains of Gygus' army's arsenal, thrown together as a makeshift superweapon. Hmm. Unlike most Sanctuary bosses, Electro Spectre does not have the normal Sanctuary Guardian theme. Instead, it shares its theme with the Kraken and Thunder and Storm. Electro Spectre attacks are strange, because most of them are actually items used by Jeff. He starts with a PSI Shield Beta, but has no method of replenishing it. Some other attacks include use an electric shock attack, which does 60 to 180 damages to two targets. It's, it's comparable to PK Thunder Beta. He also uses the neutralizer, which removes all shields, including his own. He uses Hungry HP Sucker, which takes one eighth of your max HP or 50 HP and hits the entire party. He also uses a shield killer, which removes shields from one target. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but you want to make sure that Paula has the uh, Franklin badge attached. Okay, keep her safe. On the first turn, have Jeff use his neutralizer to take down Electro Spectre's Psychic Shield. Use PSI Rockin, PSI Fire, and PSI Freeze, Bottle Rockets, or Bazooka, and PSI Starstorm. Just throw them all you got. Here are some tips. Shields are pretty terrible in this fight. The Spectro has two attacks that do nothing but remove them, and the Electro Shock attack hits through PSI Shields. If you don't have a neutralizer or a shield killer and don't want to waste your time with thunder spotty accuracy, it might be worth it to have bat it might be worth it to use bash with Paul and Pooh until it uses the neutralizer. 
removing its own shield. Once its shield is down, spamming PSI Freeze is a decent strategy. A multi-bottle rocket won't kill it immediately, but can do up to 3,000 HP, and since Electro Spectre has 3,092 hit points, a couple of bash hits will most likely kill it. Make sure to keep your HP above 150 and be ready to heal to keep the battle alive. If you can manage to do this for a bit, you'll be in the clear and ready to start the last little bit of this game. That's right, we're almost in the end game now, and it's all about to get really, really weird. Next time we travel to an entire world below the ground and fight a bit of a schizophrenic threat. And I'm talking about the two-part boss, Carbon Dog and Diamond Dog. I'll see you then. Hey fellow Fuzzy Pickles, my name is Ben Sleva and I'll be your host for this episode. Last time we helped some little dudes come out of their shells a bit, we fought a bunch of silly pillow baddies, and we brought down a coat hanger. This time, we're hopping down a random hole in the ground, deep into the bowels of the earth, where we can find and destroy one of the biggest threats we've seen thus far. It's a pair of puppies you won't want to adopt. One's a little bit country, the other one's a little bit of rock and roll. I like to call them the mood swing mutts. You're in store for a classic, my big brother's gonna beat up you moment. Okay, enough silliness, I'll just reveal it. I'm talking about the two phase boss, Carbon Dog and Diamond Dog. This is the last step before the end game starts, so know that there's a little extra weight we're carrying around this time. Last time we left our team, we had just defeated the Electro Spectre, and we progressed into Lumine Hall. It is there we find some encouraging words from the mind of our protagonist, and it honestly it has to be one of the most magnificent looking sanctuary spots. Typically, we get a little statue or some small significant spot. This time is a whole ass room. After reflecting, we drop down the room at the far end and we are transported to the Lost Underworld. The Lost Underworld is so vast that we now are represented by tiny, tiny three pixel sprites and the overworld enemies appear as gigantic dinosaurs and a moon for some reason. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. We have three baddies to keep an eye out for on the surface, which I just call myself using the word surface like we're not thousands Thousands of feet below the actual surface. Look, I'll be honest, I don't know how it works either, so don't get mad at me about it. We have three baddies to look out for you. We have Chomposaurus, and this pretty purple dinosaur has one of Paul's most powerful weapons. You have one in 128th chance of winning the magic frying pan. Go for it if you want to, chump. We have the Ego Orb. It attacks are as big as its ego. Keep your HP up and give them all you got. And the Wetnosaurus. Someone get this dino a hanky. It's strong, but not when it gets fired up you'll be able to see just what enemy is coming for you because its sprite matches its battle appearance. Now you'll benefit from receiving Paul's magic frying pan if you're lucky enough, and each enemy gives you between 25,000 and 45,000 experience points, but honestly, I would avoid the big boys if you can. They tend to be a pain in the butt. And speaking about pains in the butt, this is a perfect transition into the map of the Lost World. It is very, very vast and has some new assets that other maps don't have. For example, there are geysers, throughout the map, two of which heal your HP and PP, another one heals status ailment. There are also several items that fall on the top tier list that are spread about as far out as possible. And seeing as it takes so long to get anywhere, you better have a strategy. Here's an instant tip. If you teleport into Lost World, you'll end up in the center, from top to bottom, and on the right third of the map. That's helpful because you'll be pointed directly at a phone to save in case you're in some dire straits. It's a good reset, but for now, let's paint it from the new perspective of Ness newly arriving. Also, for another tip, uh, if you want to speed up the walking around this very vast area, use teleportation alpha, but know that if you get lucky enough with it, if you know what I mean, it will lend you back to the drop spot because you will teleport back. Okay, so from your landing spot, loop a bit up and hug that right wall. You'll see a horn of life at the far end. Continuing up the wall, you'll get to a C pendant at the top corner. Following that wall around the corner, you will begin to see your first safe haven appear in the distance. Approaching the doors will prompt someone dialogue and lead you to learning about some game details from your rock buddy. This area is the downtown area, so stock up on goods. Buy you a couple Horn of Lifes because they are literally lifesavers. And feel free to grab a bottle of DX water for Pooh's PP replenishment and a couple luxury jerkies to get you a good 300 HP boost for some added help. Once you've said your hellos, get ready to head to the left and then follow these walls all the way to the little pocket for Pooh's final equipment, the Cloak of Kings. There's also a brain food lunch you can get, but it's a bit out of the way and you can buy those in Delam, so don't waste your time here unless you end up there. From the Cloak of Kings, head south, heal at the geyser, save at the bird, and head into this week's boss dungeon. Fire Springs is my least favorite dungeon. Even if I've said before I was wrong, it's this one. I think I attribute to hate towards all the enemies being fire types, and the fire types can attack your entire party, and it's very frustrating. The enemies you'll find are the Evil Elemental. Don't let its fiery sprite fool you. Evil Elemental is weak against PSI fire, so fire away. Major Psychic Psycho. He's on fire. A strong PSI shield will protect you from his powerful psychic's attack. And his little brother, Psychic Psycho, he can read your future, but he sees burning. 
Take care not to receive his powerful PSI attacks. And the soul-consuming flame, cuter than it sounds, extinguish this menace or prepare to get burned. Slow it down with some PSI freeze magic. In addition to the crummy enemies, there are also the possibilities that you'll end up lost. But luckily for you, you have me, and I won't let you get lost. There are a few items in the cave. I will outline how to get these. The rest you can either get on your own or not at all. From the entrance, skip the first door and rope and enter door A. A will lead you to one exit, exit B. From B, take the immediate rope up, and before taking door C, take the rope to its left, enter door K for a horn of life. Backtrack to door C and follow it until door D. Exiting door D will take you to two ropes and door E. We have another fork inside door E. Taking door F will lead you to two ropes and our sanctuary boss. If you feel good about your health and abilities, then take door L, which will present you with two ropes and ultimately the moonbeam gun for Jeff. Judge the path by your current HP and item usage. Moonbeam or not, we will meet at the top of the climb and come face to face with our final sanctuary boss. Can you imagine that? We got to the final one already. How exciting. If you manage to keep all your party members alive and you've got a high amount of health left, get ready to say goodbye to all that because we finally met a prime enemy combo. The Carbon Dog is the first form of the eighth and final sanctuary. It is weak to PSI Freeze and PSI Flash. Paul and Jeff should use the Flame Pendant equipped if you have it. Use PSI Rockin', PSI Freeze, Bazookas, and Star Storm if you can. Be ready to use Life Up and try to keep everyone's HP as close to full as possible. Carbon Dog's attacks include using a Biting Attack, which is low, but it damages one target. He can charge forward, damaging one target with high power. Speaking of high power, he can spew out Flaming Fireball, which targets one person pretty highly. And the mother of all attack, shout out a spray of fire which does between 240 and 400 damage to the entire party. It's akin to PSI Fire Omega. Carbon Dog is a first phase and should go away fairly easy. After 1,672 or more damage has been dealt to Carbon Dog, it emits a rainbow of colors and transforms into Diamond Dog. You might know him as Diamond Dog. When it transforms into Diamond Dog, its reflective physical shield goes up. If the hit that tipped it over was physical, it will take the full damage and reflect it back. So, careful. <laughs> If Jeff's HP is low, consider guarding or using weaker attacks instead of bottle rockets. The Diamond Dog's ability to breathe fire is now replaced with the ability to use powerful diamondized bites, which, as the name of the attack implies, has a strong chance of diamondizing party members. Diamond Dog has higher defense and offense than Carbon Dog, but its gut stats is lower. When this form is first activated, the boss gains shield B and will reflect the move that caused its transformation provided it was physical. The Diamond Dog is able to use PSI now. Carbon Dog did not have any PP, by the way. Along with standard biting attacks, it may also howl, which has no effect. It will display the text reading, Diamond Dog is emitting a glorious light and can kill you and other party members in one hit, but it's rare. Use Jeff's neutralizer to take down the Diamond Dog's psychic shield. Use your best offensive PSI and any bottle rackets you may have against Diamond Dog. Keep everyone's HP above 150 if possible. Now, Diamond Dog has 3,300 experience points, so know that you may be in this battle for a while, especially if you don't have any multi bottle rockets. Upon defeating Diamond Dog, Ness gains entrance to the 8th Year Sanctuary location, Fire Spring. Here's some trivia for you. The transformation from Carbon Dog to Diamond Dog refers to the process of carbon becoming diamond through exposure to extreme heat and pressure. Here's some science for you. Carbon Dog is the only Sanctuary Garden with two forms, and Carbon Dog's sprite shines slightly brighter than any other one in the Sanctuaries. Not sure if we've seen a boss as difficult as Diamond Dog by itself, so fighting a double baddie makes it twice as hard. Don't get discouraged about dying a lot or losing party members, especially if it's your first time through. It's a bear. But if you keep to it in no time at all, you will be through the duo and on your way to a very unique part of the game. I won't spoil it for next week, but know that you won't be dreaming when we make our way through our very own mind and end up face to face with Ness's Nightmare. Hello, Earthbound peeps. My name is Burn Slipcover, and I'll be your host for this week's episode. Wait. Did I say my own name wrong again? Odd, right? You think it wasn't for what, where, and how we are today. You see, last time we defeated two puppies. Their death resulted in us completing the search for our eighth sanctuaries, and in turn will lead us to a very particular place. A place that is a realm of the mind. Our mind. Ness's mind. This episode, we'll deep dive into the mind of our protagonist and see what lies in the depth of his subconscious when we battle this week's boss, Ness's Nightmare. Once we walk through the door guarded by a Carbon Dog and Diamond Dog, we have a bit of a walk up to the Fiery Spring Sanctuary spot. Before we reach the end of the road, make sure Ness has a sea pendant equipped and the Franklin badge in his inventory. Do not equip the Casey Bat if you have it. Clear all unnecessary items. Leave magic truffles, brain food lunches, and maybe a bag of Dragonite if you have one. Once your inventory is set, continue upward. 
Arriving there, you are overcome with feelings. The soundstone recorded the last melody, and the full lullaby begins to play. Suddenly, you are transported into a black and white scene that you've never seen before. Or have we? We watch as a physical representation of Ness climbs a grassy hill. The entire location floats in a background of nothingness, but it seems eerily familiar. As the lullaby continues to play, a familiar house appears in frame. It's our childhood home. Though we could have sworn it appears differently in this memory. Reaching the door, the physical appearance of Ness vaporizes. Once inside, the black and white aesthetic begins to make sense as we are greeted by a puppy version of our favorite dog. Surely he wasn't this small when we left home for our journey, right? The lullaby still plays as our spirit drifts through the house and finally settles in what we remember as our bedroom. There in the center is a crib that rocks slowly. While we watch what we now know is Ness as a baby, voices of his parents begin to enter the memory and we are there for the moment he is given his name, Ness. The room is filled with the encouraging words of his parents' hopes and dreams. They don't want him to be rich or famous, just a thoughtful, strong boy. We get a hint of what a strong boy he will become when he seems to move a bottle with just a point of his finger. It won't be until Ness is 13 years old when everyone will learn what his power destines him to do. The lullaby fades and so does the black and white as we find ourselves in a very strange place. The first person we see, represented by Pooh's trainer, gives us the answer we are so desperately needing to know. We've been transported to Magic Ant, which is a realm of the mind, Ness's mind. I go into a theory that there are countless Magic Ants, but that's for a different time. The map of Magic Ant is split into several portions. There's a homestead portion where you find your mother and sister. There's also a surrounding area that appears to be like a giant garden, giving another example of how this world is a representation of real life. There's a couple buildings that you can buy items, save, and get money if needed. The second part, I feel, represents Ness's influence that brought him this far in life. You see some snowmen that reminisce of yesteryear. You find old friends, including Porky, who gives you a more than honest feel of their connection. At the top of the friend and childhood zone, you'll find the flying men, who will be your temporary teammates through the map. You'll be able to employ five of them total, and if they die in battle, a tombstone will appear outside of their house, marking their gravesite. They are a great companion, and they can actually use their own video breaking down their significance and their symbolism. Before we move forward on the map of Magic Camp, I want to go back and go over how the environment reacts to you. Every time you talk to someone, the landscape of Magic Ant will change colors. It's a pretty nifty effect, so feel free to mess around for a bit before you get down to business. I would highly suggest talking to everyone in Magic Ant, from Porky to Belch to the Snowmen. They all have their unique dialogues that reach into the backstory of the game and gives it some more weight. I have to keep reminding myself that this series is for the bosses and not every detail because I just want to talk earthbound nonstop about everything. Once you're happy with your interactions, head to the Flyman's house and grab a friend. You're ready to head into the dangerous zones. This part of your magic ant, your mind, that represents turmoil, trouble, hatred, and fear. Going forward now, you'll have a long walk to the boss. There won't be any relief and you're all alone, aside from the flying man, so be smart. Avoid all the battles you can. In this first area, each enemy is represented by a question mark or the presence. Each of these have their own erratic travel pattern, so you'll have a higher level of success avoiding them than typical enemies. And since I've mentioned the enemies, it's time for a good breakdown. You'll find the Carefree Bomb. The attacks are explosive. Keep your HP up and use your strongest physical attacks to defuse it. There's the Electro Swoosh. As powerful as this electric attacks may be, it's still nice enough to send a friendly greeting. That's where your Franklin badge will come in handy. There's a French Kiss of Death. Show this creature some modesty and a horn of life may be yours. They have a 2 out of 128 chance of dropping a horn of life. Next is the Loaded Dice. Taking your time with this foe may be a gamble because it can call on more powerful allies. And finally, there's the Mr. Molecule. The bonds between its molecules are weak, as are its concentration, PSI usage, and challenge level. These are the ones you hope to find when the question marks attack. There are two points at this part where the path forks, and they're right at the beginning. I would suggest taking the time to check them both. The first you'll find a version of yourself that will give you a baseball cap and will speak to you. And if you know anything about Ness, that dude doesn't talk very much. The other fork will give you the Goddess Band, which increases your luck when equipped. The main path of this section is a spiral that ends as a horn. Again, remember to despawn or strategize around avoiding any enemies. And not to spoil the end of the segment, but there is a massive boost of experience at the end of this, so we don't really need to grind. Once you reach the horn, you'll have one more segment before you're out of the water, literally. The horn transports you to the Sea of Eden. Here you will find only one type of enemy, the Krakens. They won't drop any items like earlier, and they're a bit easier to defeat compared to the boss between Summers and Scaraba. There are three swimming around. One will be at the end of the straightaway at the beginning. The second will be straight up from there, and the final one will be swimming around the boss pedestal. Avoid them if you can. If you end up fighting them, use physical attacks. Keep your HP up and conserve PP for the upcoming battle. Again, your Franklin badge is clutch. Once you've waded through the mystic water, you'll reach a raised illuminated pedestal with this week's boss at the center of Ness's psyche. 
Its name says it all, Ness's Nightmare. Right off the bat, you'll recognize the look. It's a Manny Manny statue, right? I have theories based on why it's appeared that way, but I think much like the statue implies, it represents greed and evil, something Ness would have placed as an evil entity in his mind. Heading into this battle, know that it is tricky, very tricky. Ness's Nightmare can do some heavy damage and can kill you in one hit. Know that prepping is the easiest way to beat him, but don't get discouraged if it takes a time or two. I remember my early rounds, it would take multiple playthroughs to beat. At the beginning of the battle, use the bag of Dragonite that you found. It does a ton of damage, then use physical attacks. That's the best way to win. Ness's Nightmare has a deadly, glorious light attack, which is actually a form of PSI Flash. As such, you should have some sort of protection against Flash. Night Pendant, Sea Pendant, Star Pendant, like we talked about earlier. During the battle, as the manifestation of Ness's evil, essentially part of Ness, the Nightmare's attacks are the same PSI attacks that Ness can use, including variations of PSI Rockin', PSI Life Up, and Shield Beta. Keep your HP up and hit him hard with everything, PSI Rockin' and Bash moves. By this point in the game, Ness already has a large number of hit points, so even if he's mortally wounded, you should have enough time to cast Life Up before your HP meter rolls to zero. So knowing that, here's a strategy that I found in my research. The easiest way to defeat Ness's Nightmare is to be sure that you have 100% flash protection, like we talked about, Night Pendant, Sea Pendant, Star Pendant, and then use Auto Fight. You heard that right, use Auto Fight. Leave the fate of the world up to, well, fate. Whether you try going yourself or let the fates decide, stick with it and you will prevail. As such, when Ness's nightmare is defeated, Ness destroys all the evil fears and doubt that were within him, allowing him to absorb the power of the eight Your Sanctuary locations. And man, it feels good once you beat this boss, trust me. Now before I leave you for this week, I will give you some trivia to tell your friends. Uh, since the playable characters' names are decided by the player, the name of this enemy reflects the player's name choices. It's only Ness's nightmare when the main character is called as such, Ness being the default name. You would figure that on yourself if Omri, for example, it will say Omri's nightmare. Bada boom bada bing. When the eraser eraser is used on the statue outside of battle, a text box will come up saying, it looks like some sort of primitive human statue. If you look at it at the right angle, but it definitely doesn't look like an eraser, does it? The same speech can be found by using the eraser eraser on the evil Manny Manny statue in Moonside. Although this requires modifying the player's inventory using hacking programs. Similarly, using pencil eraser on the evil Manny Manny statue or Ness's nightmare will result in the speech, do you really think this looks like a pencil? The background visuals for this battle is very similar to the background of the evil Manny Manny battle. Ness's Nightmare is the last of the five bosses who has the music Overworldly Foes for its battle theme. The other four being Starman Jr., Mr. Carpenter, Evil Manny Manny, and Clumsy Robot. In Mother 2, Ness's Nightmare is actually called something along the lines of Ness's Devil or Ness's Demon. However, Nintendo's American division changed this to Nightmare in order to avoid religious references in the game. And there you have it, another episode down, and that leaves us just one more boss before we part ways for now. But don't cry for me, not now. We're in the end game coming up, and we'll need to have our wits about us. I hope you enjoyed conquering our nightmare. Next time the real nightmare begins, the universe's nightmare, actually, you may have heard his name whispered through the world, or maybe you felt his icy claws scratch at your neck in the middle of the night. You are not prepared for the hell and horror ahead of us. But luckily we have a week to breathe before we fight Gygus himself. Hello Earthbound fans, my name is Ben Sleeve and I will be your host for today's episode. And speaking of today's episode, know that this contains spoilers for the end of Earthbound and Mother 2. If you found this video before watching the other 20 plus in the series, then stop this, watch those others, and come back when you're all caught up. I don't want to ruin anything for you. All good? Last time we left our main protagonist, Ness, after he had absorbed all the powers of the eight sanctuary locations. With that power, he was given a massive stat boost and he's now ready to fight and defeat the evil that has mysteriously been taking over his world. Waking up surrounded by his friends, they inform us that Ness was muttering about needing to go to Saturn Valley. Without having to leave the cave, we are transported to Saturn Valley and prepare ourselves for the endgame. It's there we find Dr. And Donuts, Apple Kid, Mr. Sanard, and the Miner, for some reason, gathered around a device of sorts. Dr. Andonis tells us that the first device, the face distorter, was stolen by a pig wearing human clothes, presumably he's talking about Porky. They have since built a second machine, which is now in front of us. As we get close to the machine and climb in, we quickly realize that the machine isn't working properly. Dr. Andonis tells us that in order for the machine to work, we need to get a material that is not found on Earth. He says the material needed is something he found as a young boy, a material that came directly from a meteorite. Unless we know of any meteorite nearby, then the entire mission is doomed. Lucky for us, our narrative is coming full circle, because it just so happens that a meteor crashing is exactly what made us start our hero's journey. Zexanite is material in question, and we're almost ready to go get it. Before heading to Annette, stop by the shop and see what they're offering. 
Now they have a flame, rain, and night pendants. They'll all come in handy. But if you get an earth pendant, which protects 50% of each elemental rather than 100% of each, then go that route. Also, now is a great time to unload any items you don't need. So you can an Escargo Express remaining items. Once you're happy with what you're carrying, teleport to Onet and make the trip to the top of the mountain. You'll find some top tier baddies here, so look out. You'll find the Evil Eye, his glare can diamond eyes, so take care of him as quickly as you can with your strongest PSI freeze. His mechanical octobot, this shifty foe can swipe an item if you're not careful. Show it that no crime goes unpunished. And Ghost of Starman, this neon pink glowing spirit holds Paul as strong as Ribbon. The Ribbon is the Goddess Ribbon. There is once again a 1 and 120th chance of being dropped, so try it at your own risk. Avoid any enemies you can, or use this opportunity to grind, grind, grind. Remember to stop and give your mom a hug before you finish your journey, because mom's worry. She'll also heal you. At the top of the mountain, check the meter to get your Zexanite, then immediately step into a clearing and use PSI Teleport Beta and go to Dalam. It is here that you will stock up on rain food lunches. Fill your inventory with them. Spend the money on it. Spend all of it. They cost 800 bucks a piece, and you probably have 100 grand, so don't hold back. From there, zip off to Deep Darkness if you'd like to stock Jeff up with some multi-bottle rockets, and then settle back at Saturn Valley where you will buy a good amount of Horns of Life. Trust me, you will need them later. Give Dr. and Donuts the Zexanite, and he'll have you rest while they fix it. The next morning, talk to Dr. and Donuts again, and he'll tell you that the phase of Storter 2 is ready to go. But first, you'll need to be absolutely sure that you're ready to go. Once you climb aboard, there is no coming back. If you're sure you're ready for the end, climb on in. The phase to story will take you to the lost underworld where a concentration of enemies has been detected. In this little bit of earth surrounded by an abyss, you'll encounter Pooh's trainer who will quickly teach him Star Storm Omega. Following the path, you will find the remains of the first phase of Storter. Check it for an additional Horn of Life. Explore the area until Dr. Andonuts, Apple Kid, and Mr. Saturn show up with the phase distorter. They'll inform you that Gygus is attacking from this exact same spot that they're standing, but from the past. The only way to get him is to take the phase distorter 3, but there is a catch. Some might say it's the ultimate catch. This model of phase distorter can't transform organic material. Your body can't be sent. Only your spirit can make the trip. And of course, there's a big chance that you won't be able to return once you're sent. Are you ready? Either you accept your fate or prepare for the Earth's destruction. Luckily, we choose to fill the shoes of the Chosen Ones and go head first into the abyss. Ness pushes the button to start the Phase Distorter 3, and the process begins. After some time, you arrive in the Cave of the Past. Give yourself a minute to take in the surroundings. We're in a place like we've never seen before. The Phase Distorter you came out of will be your healing unit and save place from now on. Note that you cannot return to any previous location. You're in the Cave of the Past until you defeat Gygus, baby. You'll have a beefy amount of enemies in the screens to come. Let's go over them. There is the Bionic Kraken. Make sure to equip the Franklin Badge and watch your HP counter. A win could yield a rare Gutsy Bat. Final Starman. He is the last of the long line of Starmen. Counter his strong PSI attacks with a PSI shield. Ghost of Starman. This neon pink glowing sprite holds Paula's strongest ribbon. Nuclear Reactor Robot. Though its fuel replenishment is quite an annoyance, take care of it last unless you want a face full of shrapnel. Squatter Demon. A single bite from this foe can poison or dynamize. Tread lightly. An ultimate Octobot. A thief and master of the electric slide. Just watch you don't get paralyzed by it. And there you have the Wild and Wooly Shambler. Watch for its PSI shield beta. It can make for a hairy battle. Of all of them, the Nuclear Reactor Robot, Ghost of Starman, and Final Starman pose the greatest threat. The Nuclear Reactor Robot explodes upon defeat, dishing out a large amount of damage to one or two party members. The Ghost of Starman can use PSI Sandstorm Alpha, while Final Starman possesses PSI Sandstorm Omega, along with PSI Healing Omega, meaning he can revive fallen enemies. It really is best to use physical attacks against these enemies, just so you can save your PP for the boss battle. The map is a straight path that takes you through three portions. The first is the butterfly area that's typically near this cutout area, and the second area has a butterfly where the path gets wide. Despawn any enemies that you can because you'll need all the energy you have. I've always been blown away about how strong this dungeon area it is. It's teeming with enemies and it's a long haul. If you don't think you'll be able to make it with all four characters in good standing, then head back to the beginning, start fresh, heal, continue on. If you're lucky enough, you'll make it all the way to the mouth of Gygus' lair. Consider yourself quite lucky. You've survived the first phase of the boss, and we're on to the hard part. Enter Gygus' lair and buckle in. You're about to be scared. The entire floor heaves and pulses as if alive, and the only sound to be heard is a steady, labored breathing. Before going on, have Pooh life up everyone to max HP, and use brain food lunches to max everyone's PP. Then, trek through this area, and ultimately you'll reach the focal point of the membrane, a single eye device. 
With a shudder, the entire screen heaves and the eye dilates, revealing a face, Ness's face, only with a blue cap. Pokey teleports from above, encased inside of a spider mech apparatus, and descends upon you. He speaks of the prophecy foretold by the Apple of Enlightenment and speaks of the very nature of Gygus. No longer is he the wielder of evil, but the evil power made manifest. Before we go over strategy, let's go back and see just what made Gygus become this powerful. A quick side note, we're only going over what happens in Earthbound and Mother 2. We're not talking about beginnings, we're not talking about Mother 3. Known as the embodiment of evil and the universal cosmic destroyer, Gygus is an evil alien who, upon failing his original mission to reclaim the knowledge of PSI from humans, intends to sentence all of reality to the horrors of infinite darkness. With an army of starmen, octobots, and other deadly machines, Gygus also uses his immense power to influence certain earthlings to assist him, such as Pokey Minch and Monotoli. His influence has caused animals and people to become violent and distressed. He belongs to a race of aliens who originally had the power of PSI. Ten years in the future, Gygus has taken over Earth and sent it all into darkness. To stop him, one of the only beings who managed to escape destruction in the future, an alien insect named Buzz Buzz, travels back to 1990X. Buzz Buzz warns Ness of the impending catastrophe. Gygus discovers the Apple of Enlightenment, which prophesizes his defeat at the hands of Ness, and so he travels back into the past in order to stop Ness. Now, wielding a vast cosmic power which he is unable to control, Gygus becomes a threat to the existence of the universe itself. In Pokey Minch's words, he is the evil power. Due to the loss of his mind, Gygus becomes irrational and incapable of thought. To rectify this, Pokey seals him in the Devil's Machine so that his power would be contained and his mind kept intact. It is here, contained in the Devil Machine, that we come face to face with Gygus for the first time. And because he is in this form, he is completely invincible. Don't even try to hit him, his shields would afflict your attack. He also is fond of PSI Rock and Alpha and Beta. So Paul creates a Psychic Shield Sigma, the one that absorbs psychic powers, but doesn't reflect attacks. To best this form of Gygus, the key is to focus on Porky. Have Jeff use any remaining multi-bottle rockets on Porky, and the heavy bazooka if you don't have any. Paula and Poole dish out their best freeze attacks, and Ness should try paralysis, which occasionally will work on him. Occasionally, Pokey will tear into you, dealing a good deal of damage, but other than that, his only attack is a stinky gas that lowers your offense. Once you've done 1746 damage to Porky, he will make the fatal mistake of turning the Devil's Machine off to reveal Gygus' true form, a swirling red mass in the universe. Porky does a good job defying the situation. So isn't this terrifying? I'm terrified too. Gygus cannot think rationally anymore, and he isn't aware of what he is doing now. His own mind was destroyed by his incredible power. What an almighty idiot. That's what he is, and you'll just be another meal to him. In this phase of the battle, his attacks are random and incomprehensible, and his speech is erratic and mindless. Multi-bottle rockets don't work on Gygus, so use the heavy bazooka. Have Ness use PSI Rock and Omega. It'll fail sometimes, but that's okay. He should also heal people as needed. Pooh should use Brain Shock and then attack with Star Storm Omega. Paula should use Freeze Omega as well. Gygus will unleash a strange attack that you cannot grasp. This attack takes a form of a purple shockwave, and you will have one of three effects. It'll either be PSI Freeze Beta attack against all characters, PSI Flash Omega attack that'll probably paralyze or kill anyone who isn't properly equipped, or PSI Thunder Beta attack. Just keep hacking away until Porky reappears to taunt you. When Porky returns, he'll say, You must really be at the end of your rope. In this bizarre dimension, you four are the only force fighting for justice. And there you stand, waiting to be burned up with all the rest of the garbage in this universe. <laughs> That's so sad. I can't help but shed a tear. You know, my heart is beating incredibly fast. I, I must be experiencing absolute terror. Do you want to scream for help here in the dark? Why not call your mommy, Ness? Say, mommy, daddy, I'm so frightened. I'm going to wet my pants. I know you have telepathy or something, so just try and call for help. You pathetic, weak heroes of so-called justice. No one will help you now. Don't worry. Your pitiful suffering will be over soon. A new form of Gygus is now on screen. A face is more recognizable, but still hard to make out. At this point, you can attack as much as you'd like. No matter how much damage you do, though, it won't matter. No physical or PSI attack will be able to do proper damage. The only thing now that will help the fate of the universe is Paula's prayers. Like Porgy suggested, you must ask for help. 
The innocent damsel in distress, Anessa's first friend, has been holding a superpower in her arsenal this entire time. Have everyone else in the party defend or heal, but have Paula pray. First, you'll see your friends from Saturn Valley appear. They'll have an overwhelming feeling that they've never felt before, and they'll start praying. Keep continuing this process, defend and heal, and have Paula pray. Next, our good pals, the Runaway Five, will feel something stop them, and they'll begin to pray for Ness and his friends. Defend and heal, and Paula prays. Paula's father thinks that he hears his daughter's voice somewhere in the void of existence, and her whole family will pray for their safety. Defend and heal, as Paula prays. It's now Tony's turn to sense his friend. His anxiety makes him pray for the safety of Jeff and his friends. Defend and heal, Paula prays. Gygus continues to writhe in pain, or is he feeling good? Paula's prayers reach Delam, and Pooh's family and friends come together to pray for the well-being of Pooh and his friends. Gygus is becoming more erratic, and his power is being drained or amplified. There's only nonsense now. Suddenly, Paula's prayers fall upon Frank Fly, our first real opponent. He stops what he's doing and prays for the well-being of his old friend. Defend, heal, and let Paula pray. The song of the Soundstone echoes through the dark childhood home of Ness as his sister, mother, and pet dog gather. His mother feels uneasy, and she begins to pray for the safety of her son and his friends. Gygus is spiraling quickly. Feeling pain now, his attacks are blindly being launched at our heroes. Defend, heal, and pray. Gygus is too strong. The prayers are being blocked by the absolute darkness that slowly surrounds. Defend, heal, pray. Paul's prayers split the darkness and reach out to someone. A name that's hard to make out. The effects of the praying is now sending needles through Gygus. Tens of thousands of damages of HP is being done by the hopes and prayers of friends we've met along the way. Gygus is reaching the breaking point as his appearance is nothing but red static. The name is now revealed to be us, the player. We've broken the walls between dimensions, and it's our personal prayers that are encouraging the heroes to not give up. Suddenly, Porky appears again, terrified. He knows he's failed. Using his spider mech phase distorter machine, he runs away into the space between dimensions, disappearing from this world, and we are left completely alone with Evil Incarnate. But it's too late for Gygus. He was able to control minds, manipulate matter, become what no entity could become, but the power of hope is prevailing. As he collapses upon himself, he is no more. His apocalyptic future is erased. He breaks up and is reduced to nothingness. The heroes have won and the war against Gygus is over. As we watch the lifeless shells of our heroes lie outside the cave, we know that this isn't the end. The souls, once captured in the machines, now drift back to the bodies of our hero children. They weren't just another victim of evil. They'll be able to explore the world that they've saved. The post-game of Earthbound is one of the best there is. You can explore each and every part of the map. Some old allies have new lives, and we still have some old people to talk to. You'll receive letters from friends, and you can even take Paula home to meet your mom. This time without the other guys tagging along. Ultimately, you do need to take Paula home, like you promised so long ago. And you'll have the chance to have Ness explore anything he wants. Get out that old bike again and finally have the chance to enjoy it. Return the book of Overcoming Shyness to the library. Why not? You're done with it. Buy the old Nat house if you haven't yet. It's so charming. In Foreside, Monitoli is now an elevator man who's completely back to his old self. While in Foreside, say hello to Aloysius Minch, who is drowning his sorrows in iced cappuccinos at Jackie's Cafe. If you make your way all the way back to Happy Happy Village, you'll see Mr. Carpainter hanging out with the cow. However you decide to spend the last bit of the game is up to you. There are countless more things that you can see, but when you're all done, talk to your mom and begin the big finish. All those fuzzy pickle moments will pay off as you see the photo montage flash on the screen below the credits. And there you have it guys, a very, very long episode to finish out the series. I truly have had a great time making these videos, mostly because the friends I've made along the way. Much like the game of Earthbound, it helps me reflect on the parts of my life and the journey we all take. I remember playing through Gygus the first time in my basement as probably a 10 year old kid in front of my 20 inch CRT television. I know I had the lights off and the entire room was illuminated with a red static and then suddenly, absolute dark. I still get chills thinking about how cool the payoff was. I'm an endings man. I think the ending of a game is 50% of it and Earthbound delivered. I think most of us are familiar with the controversy of Gygus' appearance. I'm not really gonna get into that, but him representing literal evil 
was more than any enemy that my little brain could have thought up. I think that's why I like playing the game so much. I feel like I'm personally responsible for saving the world. That might sound silly, but there's a reason I've come back time and time again. I'm not sure what's ahead for me as far as Earthbound videos. These have been quite a time commitment, and I like to take a break from writing weekly scripts. But I hope that you will continue to check out my other Earthbound videos that I've made. They're a, they're a slew. Feel free to treat the comments as a Q&A about all the bosses we've gone through, or if you just want to talk about Gygus, I'm cool with that. I hope that I've done the entire series justice, and I hope that you'll be better prepared for the bosses on your next run. Keep throwing the peace signs and saying fuzzy pickles when the cameraman shows up, and don't forget the feeling that you got when you first defeated Gygus. I've been Ben Sleva, your host for the last seven months, and like always, later days.